All right, guys, before we get too far into it, I wanted to say hit that subscribe button if you like what we're doing here and want to see this thing keep growing. If you want to help the channel, help all of us get the best guests we can possibly get, hit that subscribe button. It helps a lot. It goes a long way. Let's get to the video. All right, guys, we're going to get into this. So today's guest is Justin Jordan. Back to back. Six second Mustang, guys. We just had Brett and Jim on. Jim's not technically sixes yet. Sorry, Jim, but uh, he's he's close. He's close. Ottawa mention. Yeah. <laughs> and you were doing this in freaking 2018, man, with like, it's, I don't like to say like stone age stuff, but it is kind of compared to what people are playing with now. Oh, it's stone age. It's stone age. Let me tell you my, my trash control. I had one option for trash control and that wasn't even trash control. It was just a launch retard. Just you're talking like an MSD box. Like when you let go of the trans break, it pulls timing for a couple seconds. That's it. That's all I had. And it was all proactive, not mm -hmm. reactive. So you load the tune. Yep. And you know, you hope it goes down the track. So there was, it was AEM, yep. which, you know, now Holly bought. Um, and they were the first ones to the Coyote game for the standalone platform. And it was basically the only option. You know, if you wanted to have uh, the VCT stay functional, mm -hmm. um, you could do a Holly, but Holly did not have the drivers to uh, to run the uh, variable cam timing. So if that was a big deal, you had to go AEM. Uh, it didn't matter for me because it was locked out cams. Yeah. But they were kind of first on the scene. That's what we went with. So yeah, it, Stone Age. I mean, it's simple power glide in the car, right? Like it wasn't. Dude, it was. For people that don't know too, this we're talking about the black, um, what is it, MBRP car? Well, so MBRP was my title sponsor. That's how um, a lot of people would think of it as yeah. if you've seen the photos of it, the yeah. big red lettering on the That's side. It. I mean, yeah. every race that you could make it to. Yeah, so it was a 14 Mustang, uh, Mustang GT. It was the, my replacement for my white car, which was a 13 Mustang uh, automatic car that went uh, 860 on stock motor. Um, we were pretty stoked about that. There's a whole long story about that, but towards oh, towards your mouth a little bit more. But we um, went 860 with that, and about a month after we went 860, I got rear-ended by a, a kid in a Jeep uh, at about 60 miles an hour. Literally turned into like a Prius, like mm -hmm. it's like a hatchback. Uh, the photos are pretty crazy, but it, it took that car out, um, and so it was right when the S550 was released. It was right, it was 2015, right after uh, they announced the S550. And it was like, do I buy an S550 and start on a whole new platform? Or do I try and keep going with the S197 platform, which I liked and what, what I knew. And so I found the black car. And people weren't going super fast with those. I mean, the eight second ones were probably super common. There was probably a good amount of seven second ones. No, we were, we were the, well, stock motor, we were the, the fastest stock motor. Um, there'd only been one other eight second, but it was 890 and it was a, a new edge swap Mustang, but we were the fastest like factory production, stock trans, mm -hmm. stock, everything. Um, oh, no. so this was still, was that six R 80 then? Six R 80. Six R 80. Yeah. And Which so, is a great trans. I mean, those are it was stupid stock. impressive. It was stock. Yeah. I, I mean, the car made like 760 wheel, mm -hmm. 10 pounds of boost. When it went eight, it was 14 pounds of boost, but, um, <laughs> that, nothing. That, that was, well, yeah, yeah. Now it's like 14, you do that on, you know. Anything ever. Yeah. But back then, I mean, no one knew how Especially good. Especially on a Coyote. Oh, sure. so little. Yeah, you know, back then, no one knew how good that platform was. You know, yeah. we, were, we were pushing boundaries, you know. And at the time, there was only one eight-second stock motor Gen 1 car ever. And it was an 890 car, uh, and it was in a swapped, like a 20, probably 2,600-pound 20, new edge race car deal. Mm -hmm. You know, we're legit full weight, you know, my daily driver, it's the only car I had. And so we, I'm talking, we crept up on it. Like, I probably had... 250, 300 passes, countless hours of Mexico stuff. Yeah. Um, I've got- Just making sure that I we mean, get down the, like get through the gears, right? Dude, we, I would add like legit a quarter of a degree of timing mm -hmm. and make a rip. And do we crept, on, crept up on it so slow. And so when it went fast, when it went 860, we were fired up. I was like, that's cool. At the time, nobody had been sevens with a 6R. So we were trying to be the first to go sevens. Um, so I bought, the black card to replace it when it got uh, when it got totaled. Um, there's a story about that too, where that car is now. But got the black car, you know. And the, the goal, the idea was to be the first in the sevens in a six R eighty. Mm -hmm. um, my ignorance. I'm like, we went 860 on a stock motor. Now we got a built motor. You know, we got you know Pull some weight out of bigger it. Bigger turbos. I'm like, this would be easy. 
No. So again, back then you're talking, this is 10 years ago. There were no bill of anything. You could do clutches and intermediate shaft. There still isn't much. For 6R? Stuff. Isn't well, it still no, like? No, 10R. Still, oh, okay. The 6R, tenor. you can get bill at everything. Okay, because I, I know Lund has been breaking a lot of non-aftermarket parts yeah. that you just can't upgrade type but, of thing. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, billet one-way clutch, billet planetary, billet, I mean, okay. all kind of stuff. All that stuff was just from the Ford dealer. <laughs> yeah, it was factory parts. And it would it went on the 6R, we went like 840 at 100 and, I don't know, 65 or something like that. And every time I could try to go faster, it'd break every single time. I literally broke that transmission like three or four times. I would break it. We'd yank it out. I drive to power by the hour. Jake gracefully would almost fix it on the spot, you yep. know, thankfully. And we'd drive it back, put it back in, and try again. Get a few passes, break it, try again. And so I had, I don't, do you remember Want to Go Fast? Yeah, the, the half, half mile. mile. Yep. yep. Uh, Jumbo Air. Yep. Yep. And so we had, I, I went to uh, Want to Go Fast with the white car and it went like 100 and, I don't know, 150. 70, I think, stock motor. Those events mile. are scary. Those events have always been scary. Terrifying. Yeah. I watched a Lambo go in the lake. Yeah. Insanity. Right by John Travolta's well, house. Well, people would blow up and there'd be oil on the track and they'd just like send the next car because they didn't have equipment to clean up nothing. the had, oil. Literally nothing. People would be blown up on the top end and they'd send another car. It was <laughs> nuts, dude. Like we, we would go down the track. Yeah. And like you would just see a cloud of dust. Yep. And it's just like you're, you're on, it's, it's, it's good they stopped that one because yeah. they didn't. That seemed like almost like a cash grab. Like, I don't really care for a half mile to begin with. I like it if it's done properly. Like yeah. it's, it's cool to see how fast these things can go. But okay, so your car going down there with six R eighty, arguably really good for half mile. Phenomenal. Yeah, phenomenal. So I bought a ticket with with the white car, and then they had they had the same event the next year. Had the black car. I'm like, cool. Uh, I got six R. This would be it'll go. It will go two hundred mile an hour, something yeah. like that. You know. And I'll, I'm always at the philosophy, if you got a backup part, it's not gonna break, mm -hmm. right? If I got a spare motor, that motor's gonna last forever. If I've got a spare rear, the rear end's gonna stay good. So I'm like, if this dang 6R breaks one more time, it's gonna power glide, I'm done. I, I'm done chasing this, this you know, mysterious seven second unicorn. I, was, I, don't, I just wanna race. I'm and done. at that time you were thinking power glide, because now we'd be like 400 or you're crazy. Right, you know, and so. But power glides even 10 years ago were still I guess people still thought that was the move, even though it, now everybody's like 400 or nothing. It, it, it is the move because back then, it, 10 years ago, dump valves, yeah. converter charge, pressure control, that wasn't really a thing. Now we know, right? So now we know, hey, we can get, you know, a real tight converter, you know, you get a, a dual external dump, an internal dump, you, know, you got three, four dump valves, Lord knows how many Brett, you know, how many Brett has. Yeah. But you have a lot of control. 10 years ago, that wasn't really a thing. So not to mention you wouldn't have the, the, the computer to control it. So you could do a glide, but your gearing is all funky, or excuse me, you could do a 400, but the gearing would be a little bit different. Like the fastest guys use glides. The mm -hmm. first ever six second Coyote was a glide. The second ever six second Coyote was a glide. Yep. You know, and so at the time that was, that was the move. But uh, obviously hindsight 2020, you know, it, now, it, it, 400 is the only option, right? That's that's just, that's it. Yeah, it's been proven at this point that, you know, glides are cheap. They're, you know, you can get a glide for like five grand that'll hold 1,500 horsepower. Yeah. But then to get the 400 that'll hold 2,000 horsepower is like 30. <laughs> it's like there's such a vast difference oh, right yeah. there. Right. And then when you talk about lockup, like obviously that would Hold, be on the $30,000 trains. Oh, yeah. but And the converter, you know, $10,000 converter, it's just nuts. Yeah. You know, and so... It, it was a budget build, quote unquote. You know, I, I'm not made of money now. I wasn't made of money then. You know, You're so on we an AM. Yeah, dude. V two, like, right? Yeah, it was, no, it's Infinity. Okay, it was an Infinity. Um, and you know, stock rear end. You know, had nine inch ends on it. Just a factory eight eight rear end. You know, I, I didn't see the need to go to nine inch. You know, and we'd break the gear set and put a new one in, and that that was it. How much? Um, because now they brace them up. You send it off to TRZ. You get it all baller yeah. braced up and stuff. Was that even at the time oh, absolutely. a big thing? Yep. And so, you know, we worked the ProFab. Um, I know the guys, Don LaMana uh, yep. and Mark at ProFab really well. Um, so they always took care of me and it was gusted. It was, it was as, as good as you can get. The problem is not the housing, it's the gear set. I mean, ask Jim. 
Yeah. <laughs> it blew through his. <laughs> it, it, he, he called me, um, I think it was Thursday or Friday, and he's like, you know, kind of freaking out about what happened. He's like, something must be wrong, and uh, I, I got to measure, I got to check. I was like, well, how many hits do you have on that gear set? And he paused, and I said, Jim, if you don't know how many gear sets you have, you've got too many. Yeah. You just, that's it. I was like, back when I was doing this stuff at 3,300 pounds, I would get maybe 20, 25 hits on a gear set, and that's it. I pull it out and replace it. And he's heavier. Way heavier. And, and he couldn't tell me last time he changed that gear set. Yeah. I'm like, dude, there's nothing wrong with your car. Just put a new gear set in there. But now keep track of how many hits you got. Yeah. 20, 25, maybe 30. Yank it out, put it in the trailer, save it, and put a new one in. You know, and and because I broke, oh jeez, I don't even know. It's a relatively easy swap. I mean, I watched him do it at the track, and like, you know, once he had the parts, it's like a two-hour deal. Oh yeah, it's, it's super simple, very easy. You know, it's 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 easy to do. You and know? we talked about how it was good that it just like destroyed it instead of like broke it just enough to like get some stuff caught. Like it just ate through the whole gear instead yeah. of like trying to lock up the car. He, uh, so he, he calls me and he's like, he tells me what happened. I was like, hold that thought. I walk over and I get my, the same exact thing, ring gear. It's yeah. a, it was a gear set that ripped everything off of it. And I was like, look familiar? He's like, yep, yeah, that's it. Here, let yep. me show you mine. So yeah, it's it's a good rear end, you know, but the weak point is a gear set. There's there's no, you know, big, strong pro gear set. We're using Ford racing gears, you know, Ford performance gears. And so, you know, we change, you know, swap it out ahead of time and then go race it, you know, but we went to the half mile deal and I had the, the six hours still in the car. I, had, I bought the power glide. It was on the shelf or in my garage, ready to go in. I'm like, we're good now. Like we're, we're straight. It's going to last, you know, the, the car gods have shown down on us and we're going to, we're going to yep. persevere. The car the, is scared now a little bit. The you know? freaking next pass done. And we put it back in the trailer, drove it to my garage, and yanked it out, and that was it. But I already, I'd already bought my "Want to Go Fast" half mile ticket, and I was like, eh, "Power Glide probably be, probably be okay." <laughs> Dude, we had we had a three fifteen gear, stock gear, and had Power Glide. Dude, first gear went to like a hundred and ten miles an hour, something <laughs> ludicrous. That's like how the old cars did it. Dude, it, I, it was so funny, right? So we're at Wanna Go Fast, and these guys are trying to do a burnout, you know, and everything. I could stomp on the gas from a dead stop on a dirt road, and it would not spin the tire. There was no gear at all. Yeah. And so it just rolled into it. It was like, and dude, it went 190, 191. But the limit was stock computer. You know, back then, before we went AEM, we were on stock computer still. And Gen 1, now, now it's not a thing, but Gen 1, you're limited RPM to 8,000-ish, maybe 8,200 if you get lucky. You know, Coyote spins to 10, you know, yeah. and, and no problem. But stock Gen 1 computer. Oh, so in the Power Glide, once you're in second gear, you're just trying to... It gets fast as you can go before you hit you know, 8,000 RPM. <laughs> That's funny. And I have the in-car video. Uh, and it, and then it, even in first gear, you couldn't rev it out. No. no so I, you I were same short problem. Shifted. Yep. But it went 190, 191, I think, at half mile. I didn't want to go fast, and I changed the gear. And so the goal the goal of that car initially was to go sevens at something, 170-something. 170.01, I don't care. I want a seven at 170, all right? And, again, this is 2017. This is— We're talking 2016. Yeah, this right? is yeah 2000— Probably late 15, early 16. Yeah, because people are so jaded to that now. Yeah. So you got to add the qualifier. True. This of, is true. Because now if you're like, oh, I got a new, I got an S197, I don't want to go sevens, people be like, oh, no problem. Right. Like, yeah. Yep. Had a 10-point cage in it, stock computer, had a had a, a sleeved engine and the power glide. The goal of the car initially was to be the first in the sevens on a 6R. Very first time out with the power glide. The first time at a track, it went 8-0. Mm-hmm. At 170 something. Again, you're sitting there thinking, this is easy. I'm like, well, that was okay. Now what? Yeah. And so I would have gone sevens the first time out, out with the glide period, but we ran out of time. Like that was our last hit. And it went like first pass, like eight. Like, I, well, let me the first time out was 8 0 by the end of the day. It went like 8 40, then like 8 30, and like 8 20, like 8 0. And then that, that was it. I ran out of time. And so I'm like, okay, well, that was easy. Now what? And so we just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And 
it wasn't anything fancy. Off the shelf turbo kit from Hellion Turbo, you know, off the shelf 64 millimeter turbos, like nothing, nothing custom. It had a, a Holly intake, mm-hmm. a Holly sniper, not ported, not anything. It just yeah. dropped on, had a fuel system, and that was it. And we refined and refined and dialed in and tweaked that combo for years, like literally, literally years. Uh, I went through a couple different iterations, um, chassis wise, because it was an 850 cage. Then we outran that both with, you know, people might not know that chassis is not only for safety, it's also for traction, right? That's what keeps the, the, the car from, you know, twisting like a pretzel. So Stiffen it up. Yeah, yeah. So we had exceeded the safety of the cage and also the power, like the car, it would just twist. I mean, And that's where Profab, that's how we knew each other was Profab and those guys. Yep. Don yeah. knows how to, you know, make a chassis not twist. Yeah, no. So we... Um, and at, Matt. And, yep, it had a 10-point cage. And so... We salvaged a lot of the 10 point and we put it, we converted to a 25 three. Um, and then, then the car really started going fast. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was a lot, a lot quicker then. And it was also a lot more repeatable mm-hmm. because that, with that 10 point dude, it, it was kind of hit or miss. Like you, you get after it and it's been the tire for no reason other than the chassis just twists and it, you're, you're losing traction. Again, it's a budget build. No shock sensors, no ride height sensor, no none of that stuff. Was shock sensor even like? Did people have shock sensors? Right, yeah, race cars did. Like, yeah, like, but you would have to have a way to read the data. Okay. And so we switched from stock computer to AEM. I forget when. Um, we had run out of RPM. I'm like, for no other reason other than to spin the car higher, I need a different computer. Got AEM, and yeah, the car car did. You know, it went quicker and quicker and quicker, but. After the 25.3, you know, we did, you know, then we did carbon doors and this, and, you know, finally got the weight down. But, yeah, it went sixes at or 201 in 2018. And that was that was as fast as it went. But and we it did, was a pretty repeatable six-second car, though, was it not? So, I feel like I've seen, I feel like you had a handful of. I have a handful of 7.0s and 7.1s. Okay. It went sixes twice, back-to-back the same day. Okay. So. That car, I could, you know, it, it's it's not a brag. It's just a, just a, a testament to how much we tested. I could go any track that we went to, pull up the laptop, get it, you know, get a run, and you know, I could dial in. Ah, I want to go like a seven seven twenty to go a seven twenty two. You know, it, we just had so much data, and the car we never changed anything major. It was always little by little by little, and so we'd go to races and dial the car in. The car would just go, and that was it. You know. And so we crept up on it, crept up on it. But then, you know, with our conversation last week about, you know, wheelies and weight control and all that, it got to the point to where the, I could get I could get after it down low, but the, I couldn't get the front end down. And we went through probably three races where it would just wheelie. To it would just wheelie. And it's a matter of, you know, I got, I got used to driving it. You know, I could pedal it and we could still compete and, you know, do okay. But... It was so frustrating, man. You got to, you know, get out of the gas and slow the car yeah. down and everything. So, and a lot of that was what we were talking was that first gear ratio of power glide to rear end. Oh, yeah. Where you only have so much options and so much ability where, you know, a turbo 400, you can take a lot of the leave out of it with working with your gear ratios. Oh, yeah. And then your 8.8 only gives you so many options of good gears, too, because you there's. Two. You got two gears. Yeah, because what people <laughs> don't realize is the 8.8, a lot of the gears are just not strong. It's factory gear or no gear. That that's mm-hmm. you know, from my experience. We've tried Richmond. We've tried what's the other one? There's one other main one. They didn't last. Like they would last a couple of hits, and then you just just tear them apart. You know the Ford racing, the Ford performance gear, not lightened, nothing out of the box. Slap it in, measure it, and you're good. And that was it. And that that was the most reliable one we had. But yeah, you have you have two gear options: three fifty five. Or 373. Yeah. That's it. I think anybody I've seen try to use a different gear ratio in that deal, just it they break too quickly. No, yeah. It's the the ratio of, of pinion to ring gear size, you know, it, it just breaks. It's it's not strong enough. Yeah, I think but, I think it was Colin that broke like a three ninety this weekend and in his eight eight and it just they just don't hold. Just tears it up. Yep. Yeah. It's it's such a relatively it the part's so small and it, it just breaks. Especially at I'm not sure what his car weighs, but I'm sure it's not it's a SC three hundred at any two light, IRS. I mean, probably thirty two hundred, thirty three hundred. Yeah, probably. Most street cars are around thirty two hundred. I've found like yeah. most most any time anybody asks like, oh, what's your street car weight? It's it's usually about that. Yeah. 
we've we're line. kind of all in that same group. <laughs> yeah, or you're lying. <laughs> or they're lying. I know. Yeah. Garrett tried to tell me his Fox body weighed 3,200. I was like, uh, I know that that Godzilla is heavy, but I'm With not With what? Two that. guys in the truck? That's what I was oh, thinking. Oh, my gosh. It's like no. uh, looking under. Where's the weight hiding? It's <laughs> funny. Um, but, yeah, and so it, it we raced, I mean, streetcar takeover, and we raced NMRA and just raced any, any I mean, local, you know, no time events, yeah. anything. Back and, when uh, NMRA was... Relevant. Fun and competition and stuff. I don't know why they killed it. That's a whole different topic. I don't I don't understand the idea. Like they I don't I don't know. I don't get it. I raced it and I have my complaints about some stuff they did, but overall it was okay. Mm -hmm. And then out of nowhere they cut Street Outlaw. They cut the fast cars. Yeah. You know, and like they stopped like a lot more things became index racing. Like True Street. You race True Street to get the cape and the freaking huge trophy. Yeah. Like the six foot trophy. Of all things, why did they stop giving the trophy out? Like, you know how many, you know how much I coveted that dang trophy? Like, I wanted that trophy so bad. Yeah. And then again, I just assumed they still do it. And I didn't win that event, but I went to race it to win it. And the, you know, they had the, the the presentation and they give the guy a plaque. I'm like, what the what the heck is that? Yeah, I think that's underrated in a lot of racing. Is the trophies are very important. Promoters need to spend that's a little bit it. on the trophy. That's all that matters. The money's gone quick. Like you know, a couple grand that's gone quick. They you forget about that instantly, almost. Uh, best case scenario, what did Brett win? Ten grand this weekend? Yeah. What did that cost him? Yeah. A whole lot more than that. Well, he put a motor in it. So. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, I, and th 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 there's nothing wrong with that. He was that, gonna put a motor in it anyways, though. Expedited, you know. Yeah. It was just had to be overnight. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's cool to win the money because hey, you, you get something back, but I mean, the money is nothing. It Th goes that's up. not why you do it, right? I mean, anyone that races for the money, I mean, unless you're doing like no time, like grudge stuff, but like for what we do, all that matters. Yep. is the notoriety, the the plaque, the cool big check. I mean, you go to my shop, I got my checks on the wall. Like, I got my all my trophies now. Like, that's 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 what's cool. Where's the money at? It's gone. Donald Long has always done a really good job at that. Very good. He's got, like, a cool trophy. A you get sword? A hat. He's got like, a freaking broadsword. Yeah, you get, like, a jacket sometimes. <sighs> like, that kind of little stuff Right. that probably doesn't cost him much compared to the 10 grand you're giving out goes yeah. so far for racers. The TX2K ones are always really cool. Always these like cool custom ones. I've got a streetcar takeover one. They made they had some guy weld. It has like a like a, a couple rods and then it has like um, like a crank gear or something like that. And they build yep. this like structure and it's the trophy. It's cool. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just just neat. It's that talking piece, that cool thing, especially for shop owners. You know, like as a shop owner, you want somebody to walk into your shop and see, of course, some badass trophies sitting yeah, there. Exactly. You know, that's. So I was I was real sad that NMRA stopped doing that. They just, you know, I don't know why they do the things that they do. But I think Justin Young is in a good position to. He's got he's got momentum to push, you know, into what NMRA was. He's got a lot of classes. That would be my only thing is it's hard to keep up for a guy that doesn't know. He he enough. Does, he does have a lot of classes. There's something for everyone, which is good. And it's like a yeah, double-edged sword. Of course. Like, it's really good racer's race right. for that reason. And yeah. then there's the outlaw stuff where, you know, you're going to see people like Brad and Jim and those kind of guys right. you know, go sixes, which will be cool. November 11th, I think, is Mod Knots in Bradenton. 11 and 12, yep. yeah. Yeah. That's yep. a good so one. I think it's, it's the first year at Bradenton? Yeah, yeah first year at Bradenton. Because, yeah, it was, it was South Georgia. Always SGMP. So yep. that'll be cool. Um, It'll be a good one. I... Uh, <laughs> I had a fleeting thought we're going to we're going to try and like you know my shop is racing right it's a third name in my shop name and so I love racing you know currently I'm racing bicycles but that's a whole different story yeah. but I like I equally like competitive extraordinarily and competitive <laughs> and um it's a, yeah bike bike racing is is a different beast I learned side note I learned that from we were when we were at the wind tunnel up in North Carolina yeah most of what they did was bicycles yeah, I'm sure just a guy on a bicycle yeah for the wind tunnel this was like thousands of dollars to rent an hour and they were testing helmets I wouldn't I, I just didn't bet. understand that well you know I mean as someone who rides 250 300 miles a week I can tell you all about it but yeah it's it's uh, a lot of carbon fiber on those things I mean if I told you what my freaking race bike cost you'd laugh but I mean, it's carbon everything. There's no, it's all carbon. If it's not carbon, titanium, and then <laughs> carbon, titanium, the crank's carbon. I mean, everything. See, the saddle's 3D printed. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's crazy. I believe it. I was the wind tunnel blew my mind with that stuff. The wall of test parts and shoes and everything. 
you know, it was cool. I'll give you a little. I'm sure you can take a lot from that into different (laughs) forms of racing. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I'll give you. So it's like this, right? At when you're racing bikes, everything matters, right? Because the engine is relatively underpowered, right? You don't have horsepower. You have, you know, very minimal, like, you, you know, we talk in terms of watts. And so if you and I are the same fitness level, the yep. same talent level, right? Same and weight. Everything. And I've got aero improvements that effectively save 10 watts over a 40K race, which is, you know, roughly 45 minutes or so. I'm beating you by 20, 30 seconds. Hmm. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. It's it, that little bitty saving and when you extrapolate it out over time makes huge gains, huge difference. And so, yeah, it, these guys spend a lot of money testing to find a watt here, a couple watts there. It's, you know, I, I would, I believe it. That's cool that you saw the one tunnel though. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's up my alley. They were big on that stuff up there. I'm sure it's still big on that, but yep. it seemed to me, I was like, okay, but like there is a relative like peak performance and then you're done. Like you do all this testing and like, it seems like you can get to where your drag is almost zero. And then like, I don't know, I don't see like a big innovation, like human bodies only, you can only do so much. Well, on a race car, you can always kind of change a lot. Underbelly and stuff is so important. Like, you know, and that you would be surprised what they figured out over the last five, even ten years. So consider this, right? Go look up if you get, if you want to, but go look up like Tour de France, uh, nineteen ninety. Oh yeah, and then go look up Tour de France this year, and just look at the look at the equipment difference. Now UCI, which is a sanctioning the sanctioning body of cycling Union Cycliste Internationale. Oh. That's that UCI is the NHRA of bike of bike racing. And so, so you pay a bunch of money for not really much. You mm-hmm. Pay into it, and, and you, you, you argue about the rules. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, more or less. I love that. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, obviously they're based in Europe because you know cycling is primarily European. But you know, they govern what a bike can look like and the minimum weights, et cetera. And those rules have not really changed much in 20 years. Mm-hmm. They're pretty similar. Like if you look at a bicycle, it's the same shape now as it was 20 years ago. But why, how are they so much faster? It's just the improvements they make, you know, in body position and, you know, the, the shape of the bar, it's the shape of the nose cone, the shape. It's just, it all matters, man. Yeah. They but, don't even have a winner for the Tour de Frances, do they? Didn't they take Lance Armstrong's away and then nobody well, else came in? Se- nobody, the second place guy lost two and then the third place guy, he lost his. And like, <laughs> I would have to go back and check my facts. Um, but it's funny, Lance Armstrong, he's a very... Um, What's the word? Like uh, he he causes a lot of uh, opinion. Most guys either love him or hate him. Mm-hmm. Most people who are, are not many people who are into the cycling sport or into sport in general are in the middle. You either love him or you hate him. You know. But the ironic thing is, yes, he was doping. Obviously, we know that. But you'd have to go back like fifteen or twenty places in the peloton of the yeah. years he was racing. To find someone who hadn't been popped. That's for what doping. I heard. Yeah. Like, so, there's no winner if so, they take him out. So, yeah, he's a cheater, but they're all cheaters. And if the whole Peloton's cheating, is it really cheating? So, if you take away, like, uh, do you know who Peter Atia is? Yeah, he's the uh, fitness. Exactly. He's big on fitness. Yeah. Yep. yep. So, he did a podcast with Lance Armstrong. And it was the first one that I've ever seen because Lance has done a ton of podcasts. But this is the first one where Peter point blank ask him how better how much better were you on dope versus not what you know how much better what could you do you know what was the difference dude lance lays it all lays it all out there and so it you know it's you know quoting lance it was 10 percent, right so whatever you could do big percentage it's tremendous there's a 10 percent gain yeah you know and so you know if we're talking numbers right it's a lot to go into but we talk in terms of watts, right? So how, how many watts can you hold for X amount of seconds, right? That dictates how fast you are, right? If you and I are side by side and I can hold more power for longer, I win. Yeah. You know, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the basics of it. Yeah, you're going to just keep pulling away from me. And if we do. start together exactly. and you can 10% more, you're just going to keep pulling away from me. Yep. And, and it's s- funny because, I mean, this, this topic does connect so much, which is racing in general, where there's gray area, there's cheaters, of there's... You know, you can go back through races you've done and that guy was cheating and like he won. Like I've been there. I've been at races where I'm like, that guy did cheat, but I'm not one to go call somebody out on that. I don't really care enough. I got second place. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) I've been involved in a couple different discrepancies and mainly about rules and mainly about people not reading the rules and how you interpret the rules, you know, like event promoters, not 
enforcing the rules right. also happens. It's or, across the board. Or an event promoter siding with the guy who's sponsoring the class on the rule set. That is tough. That does put event promoters in a tough situation. But it's political. Everything. It, it is what it is. Yeah. But, you know, so I forget how he says it was on this, but the... Um, the gain is like 10%, right? So mm -hmm. if, if he can do 450 watts up a mountain, he can do 500. But he, he, yeah, he was a cheater. He's a doper. But they all were. So if you, ta if you take away that, all it does is lower the whole playing field. Yeah. He's still better. He's still the champ. He's still the fastest guy of those seven years. He just happened to be in the crosshairs. And, you know, you, depending who you ask, I think pride is what cost him his, his you know, his, his, uh, his championships. If he, if he stayed away for number seven... That's it. But he came back for number seven and got cocky. Oh. You know, yeah, he won six, right? And then he, he, he yeah. left and then he came back for number seven. He couldn't just leave it alone. And that's and that's that's when, you know, it, there's a whole lot to it. A, a former teammate who was a known doper basically didn't get put back on the team. He got he got mad and then ratted Lance out. Okay. And that was the that was the the unwinding of the ball and this it went all downhill from there. It's funny though, because if you go back far enough, like, you know, people always talk about this in NASCAR. They're like, oh man, he used to cheat so much. It was so cool. You know, if you just like the longer away from something, the like the more respect people gain for it. Sure. Like what was it? Smoky eunuch. Yeah. People brag about his level of cheating. <laughs> like they That's brag right. about it. They like right. praise him for it because you know, he do stupid things like a hidden supercharger driven off the uh, drive shaft under the yeah. car, and then he would do, like, nitrous in the roll and cages. Exactly, in the and chassis. people love it. Yeah, it's phenomenal. But, na you know, if yeah. it happened yesterday at a NASCAR race, people would be up in arms. Right, oh, yeah. <laughs> you just have to wait. It just takes time. Yeah, and it's also an element of, you know, when it all happened, you know, it's all media coverage, right? And, you know, he just got caught up in his ego, and it, mm -hmm. it cost him, and... But then, you know, 20 years later, you actually look back at the facts. It's like, well, yeah, he cheated, but the entire Peloton cheated. Yeah. He was just the best of all the cheaters. They're still all cheaters. He's just the best one. And nobody cares to call out number 15. Yeah, like, exactly. why the heck are you going to waste your time exactly. calling out the number 15? I mean, look at, like, old baseball. Mm -hmm. Look at, like, Barry Bonds. Yeah. The dude joined at, like, 200 pounds, and by the time he was he was over, he was, like, a 300 pound monster dude like he was scary what's what's more exciting baseball with guys on juice or not neither it's, it's, but i mean well, i would take the juice true <laughs> the home run derby with barry bonds and mark mcguire that whole chase that was phenomenal to yeah. watch that Where, was the only time baseball was like really peaked i feel like is when people were max doped up and they were hitting balls the farthest distance oh, over out of the them, stadium yes. <laughs> dude, I, I like mean, over Fenway out of a stadium is peak baseball yeah these guys I mean like their shirts are ripping off their arms it's like you know and then they have to go in front of Congress and talk about it it's like I don't know like you're a grown man if you want to juice up juice up it's, yeah. it's just TRT before it's time that's all it is yeah you know it's just maybe a little bit more maybe you mis misjudged how much the needle was yeah you know but even with like juicing you look at like Hollywood celebrities yes they all do it I mean if you look at like the rock he's like 60 he should not look like that and he denies that's that a is funny a thing. scary that like that is a heart issue waiting to happen 100 percent dude's a monster dude uh chris hemsworth thor yeah got asked about it. he lied and denied it. denied it it's like how do you put on 60 pounds of muscle in th four months for a roll the <laughs> scary thing is that they hold it like that yeah because you're supposed to cycle that stuff you're not supposed to just perpetually never be off of it right where your your heart's just going to explode and it's a it's a crazy spot that they're in thankfully in racing most problem is just people out of shape yeah most racers are struggling to get out of their car yeah <laughs> we don't have a doping issue no no I, ironically not doping but i got into cycling because the black car it was it was as light as i can get it before i started cutting and doing major changes right like we campaigned that car for years right we had you know mbrp was our title sponsor and had aem sponsored us he had a bunch of sponsors and so the car weighed, the lowest it got with me in it was like 33, 33.20, right? And at the time, I was like 240 pounds. And like had carbon doors, carbon roof, carbon trunk, carbon mm -hmm. carbon wing, you know, light wheels. I mean, racing brakes. It had 
without getting, I mean, I had, you know, optic armor. Yeah. You've got all the low rear. hanging fruit. You got all the mid-level fruit. Like <laughs> Next thing is, you know, cutting out the chassis, you know, cutting yeah. the floorboard. And I, I did just, it have a carbon roof at the time? It did. Okay. It was one of the first ones. Yeah. That helps a lot with 60 foot on those cars, right? You know, you know how much a carbon roof saved? How much? 10 pounds. 10 pounds. You know how much the carbon roof cost me? Yeah. Like $2,000. Probably a huge pain in the ass yeah. to put in. Uh, Profad did it when we did the 25.3 because the roof is riveted. Yeah. Um, because some of the S197s came with a glass roof, and so the panel coming out is relatively easy. But that was one of the gray areas. That's where some of the, I won't say who it is because it doesn't matter, but I got protested for having a carbon roof, which was technically true, but what if I had a glass roof? That's mm -hmm. not that's not steel roof from quarters. It's glass. Yeah. Technically, it's not steel. So what's the problem? Now, if I cut the top of the car off and whatever, but... I pulled a panel out, I put a panel in, you know, and the rules um, said steel roof and quarters, and my my, my frame of the, the car was all steel. And so I got protested for that, and my argument was, well, what if it's a factory glass roof car? So now I got to take the glass roof out and put steel in, so it's technically steel roof and quarters? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I was like, I can show you the before and after weight. It's not, it's not like I'm saving 30, 40 pounds. So you were an originator on those all steel, all glass rules being so contested. Because even the all steel, all glass rules now, they're like, but you can have this, that, this, right. and trunk, and hood. And I'm like, well, that's kind of defeats a lot of the purpose. But It's ishy. Yeah. That, that rule has always been like that. <laughs> you know, and... Again, it, it wasn't tremendous saving. I was, it, no one's doing it, right? I think we had probably one of the first carbon roofs on S197 that I recall. I never saw one because I, I, I was curious how much how much I'm going to save. You know, it was like two grand. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, if it saves 20, 30 pounds, hey, that's not bad. And it was like 9.3. I'm like, are you, like, really? I'm like, it looks nice. Yeah. But that's about it. And it'll fade over time, though, if you're out in the sun. Yeah. That carbon always ends up looking a little shoddy if you leave it out too long. Yeah, but yeah, so that so that car was it was heavy, man, and it uh, I had to get the next next weight to get out as the driver, and I'm like, well, I'm kind of fat. <laughs> Maybe, let's see, uh, let's see what we can do. And uh, my buddy Jeff um, was big into cycling, and uh, he's a good friend of mine, and he, we go way back. And uh, he's like, why don't you do cycling? Well, let's go ride bikes together. I'm like, okay. So mm -hmm. I went and bought a. So instead of buying more, the, the joke was instead of buying more carbon for the car. I bought a carbon fiber bike and then took, I, I lost like 60 pounds. Yeah, that's and, crazy. And lost a bunch of weight, felt way better. Um, not to get too far in the weeds, but my wife, uh, Melissa and I at the time, we were trying to have a baby. We tried for, I don't even know, a year, maybe longer. And nothing happened, right? I was frustrated. Like, I don't know how, how much you viewers want to know, but like, we got the app to track, like, you know, no, I mean, all that stuff, right? Not, like A lot of people deal with that same thing. I mean, I, we dealt with it a little bit with me and my wife. It's, yeah. It takes time, the app to track things and the, the struggle and the it's an emotional journey, man. Dude, I, it, I get it. it I, I think back to when I was younger, right? And, you know, being young and dumb and, like, you know, having a girlfriend and, like, hope, yeah. she, hope she won't get pregnant. Yeah, you're so scared. I'm thinking, like, I'm going to, like, you know, like blink at her she didn't get pregnant. You yeah. know, here you are. We're actively trying. Like, we're firing bullets. And we got the goalie pulled. Like, we're we're trying to get one on the goal. And it, yeah. dude, it was so frustrating. You got an app and all this stuff. And, like, it, it got to be an inconvenience. I'm like, like oh, honey, the, you know, she'd become like, oh, the app says, you know, today, you know, tonight's a good night. Let's go. I'm like, I'm tired. You know, it's like, yep. it got to be frustrating. And. Finally, I told her, I was like, look, honey, I was like, don't bring up your app. I'm, I'm done talking about it. I just, I'm, I'm over it. And you got the bike, you know, lost a bunch of weight, got healthier, bam, out of nowhere. Yeah. And we got pregnant. It was like, wow, that's cool. So That's funny. When we put the app away, too, it was pretty much the same deal. Just ignored the app. It was... <laughs> It yeah. was causing too much stress and struggle. So we're just yeah, like, I'm like, this is supposed to be fun. I, this is not fun. Yeah. I feel like I'm like being interviewed or like being watched by something. Like this is this is you know yep. this is not for me. And uh, so then you know my son is awesome and we uh, very blessed and fortunate because he's he's amazing. But I credit you know that a lot of that to you know getting healthy and losing a bunch of weight and not being you know like if you if you. It's funny. I look back at pictures now, dude. It, it's like it looks like I swallowed like I don't even know, like a, a small a small rodent. Like yeah. I, I, everything's just puffy. I'm just big, you know. It almost looks like I got just, I don't know, got stung by a million bees. 
I'm just like swollen. It just it was a bad look. It's funny people. People joke when I, I make this joke all the time before like a TX2K or an FL2K. I always cut weight. Yeah. I cut, I can easily cut 10 to 15 pounds in like, sure. you know, three weeks of like some fasting and yeah. like just being a little more careful with like how I eat. And I try to bike too. I try to ride as much. Sure. Just simple bike is. Yeah. But I can cut 15, 20 pounds and that's, that's significant. That's free. It, it matters. That is a hundred percent free weight. I tell you to what. Take off a car. The first ever it's like six, a wrestler. The first ever six second coyote. Went a six ninety nine with a nine. Yeah. If he doesn't go poop before that run, yeah. he goes a seven double o. That's that's real. Like it, the weight matters, you know. And six. I mean, yeah, they didn't back it up. And they one and done. But he, they were the first six second coyote. You what know, car was that? A JPC. Okay. Justin Bertram and those guys. Mm -hmm. I was there. It was Mod Nationals the year before. That would have been Mod Nationals 2008, 17, excuse me. And that's a good, so to also back to Mod Nationals, they, they picked a good date, good time of year at oh, a yeah. good track oh, yeah. where the DA was probably really good. That when, you, when you look at the video, no one's got shorts on. Yeah. They've all got jackets and hoodies and granted we're from Florida. So like if it's 65 degrees, we're yeah. wrapped up, but it was probably in the mid to low 50s. That, that definitely helps. Yeah, like, you know, the car gets up on the chip, dude. It's just this plume of white, you mm -hmm. know, like coming out of the exhaust, all the, the steam and everything. It happens the same deal at, like, Maryland and World Cup. World Cup, oh, absolutely. It's like... It's no secret. Of course people are fast because it's damn near December right. in Maryland. <laughs> Brett's going to go 16s this year. Guarantee it. If he already hasn't. If there's already not, I know they've done things that haven't always made it out to the internet. Could be. But I don't know if it's been, it's definitely going to go four teens for sure. I'm talking like. Six uh, teens, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's going to go, I bet he'll go a 615 or better. So what's today? October 12th? We'll yeah. See. We'll see if we'll, there's a good we'll, chance. We'll circle back. Dude, World Cup final is a 10th. Yeah. Any, over anything. Hot, hot, humid Florida, 630. Now mm -hmm. he's going to go. On accident, he's going to 620. He creeps up on that car really slowly, kind of like what you were right. talking about. Yeah. Like, the capability may be here, but I'm going to get to every step of the way right. to get there, which I think is really important. And what they do with that transmission is actually the most impressive part of that car, I think. Using that thing as six gears, right. you can hear it go down the track. Nah, 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 nah. And you're like, isn't that a turbo four? Why does it? Why does it do that? <laughs> I heard I've there's heard, some fancy lockup stuff going yeah. on there <laughs> that most people, if they tried, would leave their crank on the ground. I guarantee. Yeah, especially on the stock block. Nine out of ten people that would try that on most motors. If you try that on a two J, you're driving over your crank for right. sure. Right. If you're gonna try to lock up in first or even third gear, no shot. <laughs> they um, I've heard it shift a few times, and it, they they're doing something. That's cool. It's cool to see it. You know, I don't. I know that they're not going to talk about it, but I'm sure they've got some kind of... They've probably got a really good converter pressure control and line pressure control. they got a lot of, you know... Yeah, I think of, the power plant is, like, everybody's like, oh, my God, the Coyote, but it's like, yeah, but everything around it is almost more impressive. Well, what's, what's funny is, like, people are like, oh, I can't believe it made so much power. I'm like, why can't you believe it? Yeah. We made 2,000 horsepower five years ago on a... No, I mean not to, not to talk it down, but it's not technically a coyote, right? It's a predator block. Yeah, it's a, which is a way stronger factory block, right? It's, it's yep. GT five hundred. They're making thirteen hundred horsepower stock motors, right? And the voodoo heads, I think, are on it now. Yeah, three fifty heads, which is the go to. You know, yeah. so it's, it's not technically. But a coyote. they just flow better. Yeah, so it's not yeah. like a crazy difference there. Well, a different base circle on the cam, and you know the valves are bigger from a default. So it's, just, it's a better starting platform. It's a better cast to use, but yeah, it's not technically a coyote, right? Sure. It's GT isn't the same motor right. as that. You know, but again, I, I'm not taking anything away from it. It's awesome. But it's not technically a Coyote. Yeah. It's a Predator, you know? So the, all my, people are like, oh, I can't believe it makes so much power. Well, it's like we made 2,000 horsepower on a friggin' 2011 F-150 block. That's what I had. Yeah. It was a it was a 12-millimeter F-150 block out of a junkyard. That's what we used. And so, yeah, I'm sure dude, that, that, car, that block will probably hold 3,000-plus horsepower. You know, it's just, it's a good block, you know. It's so about it's, finding where you can, I mean. Making power is easy. That's yeah. the easy part. Anybody can put on a dyno, on a hub dyno, yep. and 
turn the boost controller up and, you know, have the factory, you know, the factory, have the security features in place if the oil pressure drops or whatever, if it goes lean, you know, to save it. That's not that difficult. The, the secret sauce, the sexiness is getting that thing down the track. And those guys do a really yeah. good job of that. They, no denying it, they got, they got it figured out. It's cool to see. That's exactly where I think a lot of people don't realize is that getting down the track and that short track, that 330. A lot of people talk about 60 foot still on that car and even like Garrett's car. But you stop think you have to stop thinking so much about that. You gotta start thinking three thirty. Yeah, there's it's so important when you're going that fast because they cover that little distance so quickly that you right. need that you gotta know the chassis is working there. Yeah, and I don't think that car is gonna go much faster sixty foot. The turbos are too big, right? Unless yeah. they're gonna spray it, right? Like we had sixty fours, right? Um, we went six ninety and then six eighty back to back passes. I left on twelve pounds of boost. It made 42 pounds of boost in 0.7 seconds. Yep. So it was all in before the 60 foot. Well before. The, it went a 110.60 or 111. I forget. Yeah. Which is arguably incredible on that chassis. Oh, with, it's, it's, with arms this long at the top. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it. it that combo was max, which is part of why I quit racing, I think, because we, we had that car and we tested for years and years. I never made wholesale changes. It was always small stuff. The same turbos, the same turbo kit, everything, right? Yeah. And 64s so, are tiny, too, for any car. It's oh, crazy that Coyotes love that. It's my favorite turbo ever. <laughs> that's 64. Yeah, dude, 64, 66, man. That's their precision Gen 1, 64. 66. They were, too. They just came out with the new ones, you know, and on my Now own. they have the next gens out. Yes. And the next gens are, like, world better. Yeah, we've got I've got Hellion 64s on the blue car right now, and they, if I can freaking figure out how to keep the cams from breaking, they'll... We'll do. They'll do well. That's quite a problem. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. So they uh, they're not going to go faster to the sixty foot because I don't think you, you can't get an eighty millimeter turbo compressor mm -hmm. wheel to spin to make the power to get moving by sixty feet in time. But that three thirty is going to come way down. And it's not like you're going to find a track that's just way better than BMP was on FL two K. Yeah. <laughs> you're not just no. going to like. Oh, no, that's that's. We had to take some out of it for BMP at yeah, FL2K. You know, and it's also, you know, I don't... Show up on a Thursday night testing tune at BMP, and it's like, wait, did you, you have to use a full 55-gallon drum? Right, exactly. I have stock axles, please. Like, <laughs> I've been to plenty of tracks on test nights where they don't even open the tractor up or yeah. fire it up. It'll sit there cold. Just dust all up and down it. And Brayton, they don't turn the damn thing off. <laughs> it's always going. They're yeah. always... It's a, good, it's a good problem to have, but yeah, they... Uh, even Thursday is, is good nights. But yeah, those, they're going to go faster, right? The 60 foot, I don't think will get too much better. Maybe a 109. But that 330 is going to come way down. That They're going to fly with that thing. We talked briefly about a 315 tire because if it's allowed at World Cup. I wouldn't run it. It's just a lot. No, I would have to make a lot of changes. Well, it's going to slow the car down. Apples to apples, it slows the car way down. Because hmm. you lost effective gear. It's not 28, now it's a 29 and 29 and a half inch whatever tall tire. Yeah. And it's, you ever picked up a 315? Yeah, they're big. Oh, they're heavy. Yeah. They're really heavy. So it's it's almost like rear end, right? Like I ran an 8.8 .8 in my car if, because if I ran a 9 inch, the car would be slower. Now it would be more reliable, yes. But you only need as much strength as you need, right? Like I think of it in terms of like almost like space shuttle safety factor, right? Like those guys, they go to space with like a, 1.03% safety factor. Whatever they're in mm -hmm. is about 3% stronger than what they believe it needs to be to make the trip. Because the more, more the safer it is, the heavier it is. And you're talking trying to get to outer space, they got to you know, back the payloads down yeah. and they're not using extra layers of carbon. They're, they're using the bare minimum to, to make it happen. And so with that logic... Because it's significantly lighter to put an 8.8 in a car than probably most 9 inches. Probably 100 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, Eight, eight to nine inch, it's and they're easy, less a resistance. A whole lot to less, turn. exactly. A whole lot more, less yeah. drag, and so I didn't need a nine inch. Now I'd break the gear set, but that's a couple hundred bucks in a few hours to, to do. Yeah. Even less if I don't break it. If I just take it out proactively, and so with that same mindset, unless he needs a three fifteen tire for traction, that car will be a lot slower. So hmm. I imagine they're going to keep a two seventy five. Now, if he does something it like... It fits so many more classes like that, too. The 315, too. yeah. It looks better. The 315 really shouldn't fit many classes. It's just like yeah. it's like a weird big tire, small tire deal that just kind of sits in its own realm. Yeah, I've seen the Viper guys complain about not being able to run because... Yeah. But 
I'm okay if you're IRS. If you got an IRS Viper and you want a 315, like you have another handicap on top of it. Right. That I think it kind of makes it okay. But if you're solid rear axle V10 with twin 80 millimeter turbos, oh, 315. Yeah, that's, I don't know if you get also the nah, 315. That's true. <laughs> I think you can only get a couple of these. I mean, especially too, if you're trying to grow a streetcar class and have more cars fit the rules, until you start seeing Vipers dominate, let them run. Like, you know, yeah. any tire, whatever, as long as you got stock style we're in. But then you get the gray area, well, stock style. Yeah. I know, that rule is crazy. But yeah, I mean, until you start seeing the Vipers, you know, coming out and dominating and, you know, not ruining the classes, but I, I, That's I'd, I'd let them run. I mean, I've never seen a Viper on 315s come and run through any class. I, it's lot, never happened. So. Yeah, there's a purple one. I forget whose it was. There's a purple Viper. Yep. And it sounded like the second coming of Jesus. It was ridiculous. It was the gnarliest car I have ever heard. Yeah, I think that was the Pro Speed one at the yes, time. Yeah, yes. they, were, they were the one dealing with that. Dude, I was at like probably eighth mile. Yeah. And I think came by and I was like, holy, dude, it just sounded like the gnarliest car. Any of any I've ever heard. I'm like, wow, that's cool. And then I never saw them again. <laughs> they make a lot of power on those yeah. V10s. Those Viper V10s, they may sound like a tractor when they're idling, but they make a lot of dude, power. Coming down the track, it did it's like I thought the stands are gonna be sucked in. It yeah. was just it was like at like level twenty of that of that just raw, visceral, you know, whatever, twin eighty eights, whatever they're running, yeah. just that full song, just there's so few of them too. Like when you see a drag racing Viper, it's like something special. Right. Like it's there's something cool about that. A Viper that is actually going to go from a dig to right. the Turbo 400 like they're doing now, which is yeah. really cool in itself. I know um, Nin, uh, Nth Moto, Nth Moto yeah, yeah. is doing a lot of those. Yeah. And it's just there's something cool about that. Especially the ACR ones with the wing and stuff still on there. Yeah. There was one at TX2K that was like wheeling to the 330 and going yeah. 680s. Golly. <laughs> what was the rear end on that one? Was it IRS or solid? I don't know if they've fully talked about it. <laughs> so solid axle. Got it. it looks like it's still IRS, but I'd have to ask Aaron if he wants to be, uh, if he's ever really talked about what's going on back there. I feel like if it was, they would make sure people knew. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like... I don't have any inside yeah, knowledge on it. I've just... <laughs> the way that I've seen it work on the track, I have questions. I mean, <laughs> I mean if it is IRS, I'm sure it's got a 9-inch tenor, but yeah, if it's IRS, that's really cool. You can tell how a car works on the track, what it's got in it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can. It's not, a, it's not rocket science there. My car is weird because it doesn't separate very much, so you can't really tell that much, but I got a stupid torque arm that tries to do stupid things. You know, we talked all about that. Oh, yes. So the 2020 car is your shop car now, and you're trying to make 1,700 horsepower, close to 1,700 horsepower on something that realistically should not have, or looks like it should not have 1,700 horsepower. Well, yes. So I'm not sure how much time we have, but... You're good. This, Let's talk about the 2020. Golly, this thing, I almost... almost oh, wow. It's, uh, it's testing my patience. It is... It's... It's taken a lot in me to not just, I don't know. So rundown on this car. It's a 2020 S550, is that what yep. it is? Yeah. So it's a 2020 S550. Um, stock trans, 10 speed. It's not. It's 10R, but it's not stock. Okay, it's 10R, yeah. Yep. And OEM. So, yep. And so the goal with this car was to go eight daily driver stock trim, right? So with my son's baby seat in the back, you know, because, like, I've already, I've already got – a race car. I've got two race cars. I don't want another race car, right? Like the race car, street car, whatever. They all end up being a race car. Yeah, you know, but like, you know, all oh, that's a race car, it's a street, whatever. Like, I don't want another caged, you know, gutted car. And my my black car wasn't gutted, but I mean, it's a race car. It has a 25.3 cage, you know, and yeah, I can drive it, you know, anywhere and whatever, but, you know, that's it. It's, it's a purpose built street slash race car. Yeah. I didn't want that. You know, the blue car, I wanted it to be a daily driver. I could give my wife the keys. She can go to Texas if she wants to. She can go to Georgia and drive it and just enjoy it, right? And it'll well, it's run. a good shop car for you, too, to show off. Absolutely. Because most customers aren't coming in thinking they see the black car and they're like, I want that. Right. Most right. customers will come in and be like, oh, I saw an eight-second car. I want that. Yeah. And, and you know, I've, I've, 
I've already done the analysis. I've it's it has paid for itself many times over. And so it was it was the right it was the right build. And so we went eight uh, eight fifty at one hundred and sixty three, drove to the track eight fifty and drove home. My son's baby seat in the back, like full exhaust, like like nothing out of the car. Yeah, everything that came from the factory is on there. Um, and <laughs> plus so, added weight. Yeah, so you it's know. heavier than factory. Yeah, I mean, well, it's got a drag pack, so probably lose some weight there and, and turbo kit and stuff. Yeah, I mean, and it's but it's got a carbon drive shaft, you know. But it, there's it's got a back seat, right? My son's baby seat in his back it has yeah. a passenger seat. It has because oh, those probably come two piece factory, right? Yeah, two piece. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's probably not happy at seventeen hundred shorts. No, no, it got a carbon shaft almost yeah. from day one, um, and so it made a thousand forty on stock motor. Uh, went eight fifty, drove it, you know, raced it here and there. I mean, I say race, you can't really race a ten R. <laughs> I test and tuned it here and there a little bit. Do they not like to leave off of a pro tree? Um, they don't like trans brake. Okay, right. So you can you can actually you can activate the trans brake in the factory calibration. But it, it's a good way to burn stuff up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 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 not a real trans brake like what you what you would use a trans brake for. It's 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 manipulating clutches and you know if you need to, uh, if you need a trans to bind and lock up, you activate two gears at the same time. Yeah, like different first and reverse on a power glide. Exactly holding each other. That's why when you see somebody go in reverse when they get on the trans brake, exactly clutches but, are burned up. But exactly and so. The same principle applies, but you don't do first and reverse. You do like the the intermediate clutch pack and the and the low clutch pack, right? And you activate them at the same time. Now you've got two gear ratios trying to happen at the same time. The trans is bound, locked up. You let go, it releases the one. The car goes forward, but it burns them up pretty bad. And so I don't use the trans brake. We use a, a second gear leave and leave on the foot brake. I got my two step built into the foot brake, and it works fine. But it's just it. it, it you can't cut a tree on a foot brake. You can because there's foot brake guys, but it's not the right. It's not and the right. Bracket racers are fired up. Yeah, right now. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Well, foot there's a foot brake hero out there right uh, now. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get trouble for that. But yeah, it's a test and tune car, right? It's just you know fun to drive. You know, it's fast, mm -hmm. and you know I can go to test and tune and just you know run whatever. And so the first goal was to go eights stock motor, which I knew would be fairly easy, and it was. Um, and the second goal is to go sevens. And so I had a short block built for it, uh, put the heads on, you know, timed everything every, and all that stuff. And it's got 64 millimeter turbos, nothing fancy, just a regular off the shelf Hellion kit again. And like always, I crept up on it, 1,000, yeah. 1,100, 1,300. And we got up to like 1654, I think it was. And I heard a misfire. I heard a little bit of a breakup. And I was like, eh. I was like, it made it made power, but you look at the graph, like it was on it was on target to make seventeen hundred and change. Yeah. But it laid down at about five thousand RPM. And that's when the freaking drag racing gods like kicked me out of the kingdom, I guess. I don't know, because I have spent the last three weeks chasing down any conceivable possible reason for a misfire. Mm -hmm. You name it. You tell me, Coop, your car's misfiring. What would, you, what would you check? What would you change? First, I would probably swap plugs. Done. Change coils. Done. Swap some coils around. Done. Then I'd probably blame the Ford Union for some wiring stuff. You, tr you try a new harness? Yeah, I'd probably Done. think about that, too. Try a new PCM? <sighs> man. Done. Oh, man. Would you, pull the, would you pull the cams out? Check the cams? Would you, I would definitely pull the cover off, that's yeah. for sure. Would you make sure the valve springs weren't floating? Would you put new valve springs in? I would definitely check the would compression you on it. Would you buy the machine to check the actual seat pressure, all that stuff, and make sure they're good? Mm -hmm. Done. Would you do a leak down test? Done. Would you do two leak down tests? Would you do a third? Done. Compression test? You name it, I have done it. I have done it. But I think I may have figured it out. We're going to find out. But dude, Coyotes are really good at, like, audibly telling you when something's wrong i've noticed like ls's can fool you right. a little bit like you hear a noise and you're like i don't really know what that is but like i've seen the coyote guys like hear a noise and they're just like that's that right and they're really good at audibly telling you what's going on car runs fine which is cool car runs fine so what happened so i got a little excited but so it made 1650 i heard a misfire i'm like dude stock cams stock vct mm-hmm I'm like, it's probably floating the valves, 44 pounds of boost. I mean, it's probably not really happy, you know, because I'm an idiot, I think. 
I'm trying to keep VCT and keep stock cams. I want it to be, yeah. I, I, I want it to be a, a, a true comfortable seven second daily driver that you or your friend or your wife can hop in and drive. Does that help get onto boost quicker too though? No, not really. Can you use it like that? Like where it kind of... Yeah, it'll help. Yeah, VCT is is tremendous for spooling. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's like a street car that you're going to, you know, somebody pulls up next to you on the highway and you stomp on it. It'll help you kind of... Oh, it goes. I bet. It goes. I bet it's fun. (laughs) It's a lot of fun. Um, But, you know, I want a nice smooth idle. Like... I've seen it firsthand where like someone will you know give me the keys something and, the, and they'll they'll I'll get like a three or four preface okay just so you know it does this weird also this is kind of funky but you know you gotta jiggle the key it's like oh I need to give a book to somebody if they were to drive one of my cars well that's okay yeah you know well it's a race car too I yeah mean. yeah it's you know, different you know but like if I drove you a Yukon you wouldn't be able to like well maybe is it Yukon run okay the Denali, the Denali, truck. excuse me, yeah, yes. the truck. Yeah, no, you'd be yeah, fine. Yeah, you'd be fine. same thing, right? Yeah. But I wanted to be here. Here's a seven, here's a seven second key. Take you and the family out to dinner. Like whatever. you may not notice as you pull out, yeah. and then you're like, get on it a little bit. And yeah. Then you're like, oh, what? Yeah, the heck? Exactly. You know, and so I don't want fancy. I don't want lockouts. I don't want you know bigger cams. I want it to be. For one thing, the 10R ain't gonna take 18 horsepower. No. No. Now the dyno, I might get away with it, but as soon as I go on the track, it's going to check out. Maybe so, spinning on the street a little bit, you know. Maybe, right? And so it's strictly just just to see what kind of power the stock cams will do. Mm-hmm. And so b- because I run VCT, I can't have a lot of seat pressure on the springs, right? The valve springs have to be just enough to hold the valve shut, but not so much to overcome the VCT trying to function properly. And so it's a real delicate balance. So I thought for sure, oh, floating the valves. Put new valve springs in. Well, I, I check a few. They all check okay. I'm like, eh, it's probably still springs. Put springs in it. That wasn't it. Did change. Did we've been down the rabbit hole really for like three weeks? And because the weird thing, it's got misfires, audible misfire. You can hear it. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's not like it has a cam in it. But mechanically, nothing is wrong. The VCT, like I'm logging, I'm checking everything, right? The VCT, all four cams are dead on commanded, right? If I run, you know, it's got dual injection, right? It's got direct and it has yep. port. And then the port, the factory stuff, right? Yep. And so if I if I turn the port off and just run it on DI, it runs pretty freaking good. A little bit of a misfire, but if I turn the port on, it loses its mind, goes bananas. Hmm. We'll try new injectors. We'll, yeah. tr- we'll try. I'll send my guy down here to Bradenton to pick up. Uh, 20 gallons of ignite red. Just maybe the fuel went bad. I don't know. Maybe maybe the the ethanol in the tank just got water in it somehow, and it's you know the DI is is mm-hmm. is you know hiding because it's got such high pressure. Maybe well, it's helping. and then your level of people that you can talk to about this problem probably gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Exactly. And like you know you're gonna call up somebody and be like, hey, I'm having these problems. They're gonna say the same stuff you already checked. Exactly. You're gonna have to teach them the problem first off. <laughs> exactly. And so. Uh, you know, John Yuris and I, the owner of Hellion Turbo, we've been, you know, we, we're real good friends. Um, he's been a, a, a phenomenal business mentor. Um, I can call him up on Sunday at 6 a.m. and he'll answer. You know, he, yeah. he's a good dude. I have worn him out. He's not, he's not upset, but I have worn his phone number out calling, trying to, all right, John, I tried this. What do you think? We spit wall, spit, spit wall back and forth. Crank sensor, cam sensor, you name it. Like, you name it. Just, it runs okay on DI. When port comes on, it loses its mind. Hmm. But I think, I think, well, I'll put it this way. I'm about out of things to check. Yeah. So I didn't just figure it out. I'm just out of stuff to check, right? The next the next logical step, pull that motor out, yeah. put the stock motor back in, see if it does it. If it does, then uh, I don't even know. But if it doesn't, then something's wrong with the engine, even though compression and leak down are fine. I think, after you know, logically thinking about it, I think I spun the cam lobes. I was gonna say, or because you got weld them on that, so it could like hop a tooth. I was gonna say hop a tooth or something. I literally, I literally text Jim last night. Hey, you got pictures of when you weld your stock cam lobes? He's like, yeah, I had to go back and yeah. find them. I'm like, I think I'm, I mean I can't weld them now because they're probably they're probably smoked. But uh, while I'm here, I got I got one of my guys you know, pulling the valve cover. I don't. The thing is, I looked at them before I put them back in. Mm-hmm. And they looked fine. Like, you know, I didn't like, you know, I don't have anybody to measure. Like, I, I don't have, like, a bunch of spare cams, you know. Like, they looked fine. Yeah, like, for people that don't know, the Coyote cams are pressed on lobes. They so are. So they can spin when you really have at it. And they, they, I know people weld them for that exact reason. They, they have, just tack them in a couple spots. Yep. Yeah, they have this weird, like, cog 
engagement. There's like gear tooth uh, engagement. And the thing is like, it makes sense now. Now that makes sense because why would it run better on direct versus port injection? Because hmm. DI is spraying into the combustion chamber on the compression stroke. Yeah. The, the window of injection is very, very small. Now it still misfires, but not nearly as bad. But port yeah, is going to be spraying, spraying into late, a... Delayed. Yeah, it's going to be spraying into a closed valve. Mm -hmm. Well, if that valve ain't closed and the computer thinks it's closed, it's going to be spraying fuel into an open chamber. It's going to cause a misfire. And this is all on a factory Ford ECU 100%, as well. 100%. Factory. And those new ones are pretty good, it seems like. It's phenomenal. They seem like Dude. they really figured it out. Yeah, I mean, so... Like fuel trims when it's on direct injection, perfect. Yeah. When it goes, when it when I, when I turn the port on and it goes bonkers, bank one goes haywire. Hmm. So it's either an exhaust or intake cam on bank one, either has one or many spun lobes. At that kind of power, are you still using direct injection the same as they factory intended it? Absolutely. Or is it turning off because it does mm. help compression pretty much, right? Like it. Direct injection is is extraordinarily powerful powerful i saw it a lot when you know when i was at jeremy's shop and uh, every c7 on yeah. has direct yeah. injection only right which is the sad part of it ford is smart they did that they both. did both yeah um it is if i if i remember i want to say the new zl6 is dual the new um c7 zr1 yeah was is. dual but they max out almost instantly. Yeah, I think that one I saw like eight hundred horsepower. Everything's maxed out. Yeah, I think it was also that was more to do with keeping the cat the cats from getting too hot too. I think they're using that for cat over temp. Mm -hmm. I think from what I remember. But yeah, Ford got I think it, it right. Cleans the valves a lot too on that deal. It definitely helps. Yeah, but yeah, do the BMWs have dealt with that forever? Where yeah, yeah. the valves are just wrecked. Walnut treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The. Um, Ford got it right. I mean, here's how good the DI system is. At 1,650 horsepower, the DI is making up 25% of the total fueling. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's not immaterial. It's a lot. Yeah. You know, it's at 1,000 wheel, it's like 47% DI. That's pretty awesome. Yes. That's that's huge. I mean, that and those injectors, you don't change, right? You just... Well, we will. <laughs> but yes. Um, yeah. uh, Uva at extreme, uh, uh, extreme direct injection. X Extreme X, injection? Yeah, XDI. Yeah, yeah I've uh, heard of those They guys. make injectors, they make a pump, um, and they actually make a camshaft. So it's a stock cam, but they regrind hmm. the DI lobe because, you know, the DI pump is mechanical. Yeah. And is so, it just on one cam lobe or is exhaust it? Exhaust bank one. But just, yeah, so only one cam is specific yeah. to. Yeah. That's interesting because I'm used to it on a C7 where it's like the one cam is yeah, what you get anyways. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it'll be uh it's exhaust um exhaust bank one has the the DI lobe. Triangle cam. Uh yeah. Well it's a it's a square. But yeah. Oh is it a square on the uh, I think they're a triangle on the Corvette. It might be triangle. Not important anyways, but yeah. so, <laughs> it's funny how it it's works. It's hexagonal. Like yeah. It's yeah. funny how it does that though. If you're not used to seeing that, seeing something cam pump right. for whatever it is, seven thousand PSI or something crazy yeah. that they have. I don't know. I know it's a very high pressure pump. So up through, so 23 is a uh, 3, 000, 35 or 3,000 horsepower. Uh, the new one, the one in the, the Mustang GTD is 5,000. And so the rumor is that the 5,000 PSI pump will be coming to production Fords probably late 24, maybe 25. Hmm. But So people will be buying those from Ford as soon as there's availability. DI's to put them on the old stuff. DI is the truth, man. I mean, I see all the time on social media guys are bashing DI. And it's like, DI is such an advantage. Yeah. Like, first of all, you got two fuel pumps and two sets of injectors. Yeah. So you already have a better fuel system from the get-go. But now you've got a system that's designed to suppress knock and increase atomization and make more power. Why would you want to turn it off? I, mean, I don't understand. Diesel guys have been using that forever. Yes. It's literally just diesel stuff to help their compression and to help because they need giant fuel flow. <laughs> yeah, 30,000 PSI in those things. Yeah. Insanity. But yeah, so I've gone back and forth and back and forth. And every time I think I got, dude, <laughs> I probably shouldn't tell people this, but this is my, this, this I thought was the big aha moment. And so when it misfired the first time on the 1650, I heard the misfire. I was like, hey, let's, let's check the plugs. Check the plugs. Plugs look okay. No big deal. We'll put new plugs in. I was like, yeah, you know, maybe we're having a problem with the, the spark energy. Get my dielectric grease out. 
put a dab on the coal packs, put the coal packs in. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, it starts misfiring like crazy. Did you know that dielectric grease is not a conductor? Huh. Is it just to make the plugs come off easier? It's an insulator. Okay. It's to keep stuff out. Oh. Water and crap out. Because I always put it on mine, and I, I know that it helps me get them off, which is really, really tough to get off of a 2J car. So the difference is you have spark plug wires that physically click yeah. into a spark plug. We don't have that. We have coil on plug. And so my big epiphany was, dude, I put dielectric grease in the coal in the inside the coal pack. I basically took the spark plug and put a physical barrier between it and the coal pack. Yeah. No wonder it's misfiring. I was like, oh, what an idiot. So I come in the next morning, I'm I'm stoked. I'm like, that's it. Yeah. I start Googling. Stayed up all night. <laughs> dude, I'm telling my wife, and she's like, okay. I'm like, honey, I'm like, look, check it out. Google says. I Google, can dielectric grease cause a misfire? And the first, the first reply was, yes, it can. I'm like, yellow bullet from 2006 no. said. <laughs> and so it it come, has to do with, you know, a spark plug wire clicks on. You have, it's a physical connection. Well, yeah. coal pack wire, does it clicks on, but not really. It kind of like slides over. So you're still in using factory coil on plug deal and yeah. everything. Oh, yeah, stock coils. Yeah. Yeah, stock coils. And so. the IGM-1A deals once you make that kind of power. Yeah, you got a lot it of help. A lot, lot of lot of kilojoules to fire that, that yeah. thing. I got stock. And I then mean, I could melt a hole through a block with that thing. Yes, and I couldn't. I couldn't melt my way out of a, a, a ice cream cake, and so couldn't make the connection even. Yeah, and uh, so I thought, dude, that's got to be it. Yeah, I, I text my, one of my guys at like eight thirty. I was like, bro, I was like, I figured it out because hmm. we've torn the car apart. But I mean, it's been a mess, right? Come into the shop, feeling good, walking in, you know. I'm like, all right, yeah, here's it. Google says it's this. So dielectric grease is like, I mean, it's like tacky. And, dude, it took us like an hour and change to clean can't all. can clean that off. Y- yeah. I had I sent one guy to get Q-tips. We're cleaning the, clean everything out, brand new plugs. I'm like, we got it. This is it, boys. Fire it up. Not a lick of difference. It's been that story for like three weeks. Just thing after it's thing. It's just, I think I got it figured out. That's on it. It has to be this. Like, it's it's a global problem, right? It's not it's not a crank sensor. It's not a sensor because if it was, it'd be intermittent, a, and it it wouldn't ma- it wouldn't matter what fuel it's on, it would do it. Period. Yeah. But it's way worse on port injection than it is on direct injection. And so I thought, do I got new new, new plugs or new uh, injectors? Got everything all brand new. And so, it almost it almost has to be the lobes. You know, because people spin them, right? That's, yeah. that's the thing. I've seen it, but I've seen people talk about it plenty of times. I mean, it's not uncommon to spin the lobe. That would be probably the most ideal answer. At that point, you wouldn't have to pull the engine. Yeah, you know, I mean, I ordered new cams today. Like I, so I have I have cams on the you know like takeout cams, but I don't know the history. Mm. I'm not sure. You know, I, I they don't could know. be spun as well. Yeah, exa- exactly. You know. So put as, some OEM one. Yeah, but are you gonna weld these ones? I mean, you kind of have to now. If I, I need, I need, I need to find a smoking gun. Mm-hmm. And so I got my guy pulling the valve cover. Valve covers off. We'll look and see. It. Even if it doesn't, I mean, what else? I don't know what to do. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm out of parts to change. I thought so. We pulled the PCM out. I've got a spare PCM. You know, just, uh, just parts in the shop. Mustang guy stuff, you gotta yeah. have spare. Everything. Once you have a shop, you just collect all of it. Dude, the amount of spare crap I have in the shop is ridiculous. I could probably build three cars. And I pulled the PCM out and like, yeah, you know, I pulled it out and look, I was like, dude, there's like eight eight of the pins are orange. They must have got hot. I bet the PCM's bad. Yeah. Put the PCM in, program it, do all this rigmarole, redo the pats, get the stock mm-hmm. car, right? Thankfully I've got I pay for access to Ford's you know, system. So I can actually program pats the way you're supposed to and everything. Put the PCM in, program that, program the keys. Oh, I forget. So I have my one key. I had to go all the way home, get my other spare key, come all the way back to the shop. I'm like, we got this. You know, program the PCM, yeah. fire up. Purrs like a kitten. Sounds phenomenal for about 12 seconds. Huh. Then it's like, I'm like, not the PCM. Pull it back out. 
reprogram it, redo the pats, do this, it's been. What do you tune that car on? What software is it? Is it? HP tuners. Is it HP tuners? Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't know how much they were tapped into that Ford side of things because I know there's so much craziness going on even on the HP tuner side of like you can't turn off certain things now on some, certain cars. They. <sighs> GM, they're really kind of struggling to get into. Right. Like the new C8 stuff is almost like. Yeah, the Global B. Yeah, yeah. like and. I don't know how much Ford's doing that. I mean, you got a dark horse too, so you're probably even deeper into the new PCM stuff. And then they added the dual throttle bodies on you, and now. Well, it's so funny story about that. Um, yeah, it, the stock computer. I mean, consider it's 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 a Bosch ECU. Yeah, it is extraordinarily capable if you know how to tune it, know how to how to work it right. The fact that it's got dual injection that blends seamlessly, like you would never, if you weren't looking at the log, you never know when they shut off or when they blend. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got individual cylinder knock control, fueling, timing, everything. It knows what cylinder picked up a knock event and it pulls timing out on a cylinder by cylinder basis. Oh, wow. It's phenomenal. Yeah, I know the Bosch stuff is top tier on like the diesel racing. That's what they all want to use. Right. It's, it's just expensive. Yeah. Because Bosch. Make some good stuff. Yeah, dude, I, I pulled, it's, it's a it's a Bosch PCM, hmm. you know? And so it's almost like, it's almost like an Android phone, right? Like think back in the day, I mean, everyone, everyone's iPhone now, but back in the day, you get an Android phone, you, you unlock, unbrick it, right? And you could put your own OS. Mm -hmm. But the hardware is really, really good. But out of the box, an Android phone has like the bloatware, all that crap that's on it. To me, it's kind of like that, right? Like we have a really nice Bosch PCM, but we've got a Ford, you know, 50 state legal government, you know, federal, you know, license or whatever. Yeah, they designed that software on the Bosch hardware. Yes. And so you're kind of, you're kind of stuck with like a crappy, you know, firmware, if you will. But still, the capability of the PCM is, is incredible. And so if you use it to its full advantage, it is nuts. I mean, cylinder by cylinder timing, fueling, knock, everything. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. And so I think, I mean, it has to be the cams. It has to be. If it's yeah. not if it's not the cams, I mean I've got I've got a shiny hundred dollar bill or maybe more. There I, may be a car for sale. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's, it's always the go to. You know, after a race, you're like for sale. After yeah. <laughs> it, uh, it's it, I think we got licked. But if that's the case, that's good. I can put cams in it. I'll weld them. No big deal. Yeah, and then we'll see what kind of power it makes. So what do you think of that new dark horse then? I was at the track with you the other day. I made a joke about the weight on it. Right. <laughs> they're, they're heavy for a two-door car, I will say that. Extraordinarily you know? heavy. But every car is heavy now, unfortunately. They're all loaded with everything under the sun to be yeah, I thousands mean, of pounds. So, I mean, I have opinions. It's um, an MT-82 still, right? Yeah, 3160 Tremec. Oh, okay. That's yeah, Tremec. I haven't really seen much about the 3160s, though. GT350 Trans. Okay, those are tough. That's nice. I mean, it depends who you ask. People say they're worse, but I... Worse than the MT-82? It, 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 it's the internet. People said that was pretty bad from what I've seen. But yeah. some Mustang guys go fast with them. I've got 1,000 horsepower guys on stock trans. Yeah. It's... I I, I like... I think there's a lot, lot of variation there. I've seen some MT-82s that are bulletproof, and then I've seen some guys that, you know, can't keep them from destroying themselves to save their life. My first ever Mustang was a 13 MT-82, and I broke it racing Victor, of all people. Um, we were street racing, uh, out, well, I won't tell you where, but we were street racing and he had his GTR mm -hmm. and we had a dig race locked in on like 50 bucks, hundred bucks, something like that. And at the time it was a nitrous car, had like a 150 shot on slicks, you know, skinny is the whole deal. And, uh, <laughs> I know, if you know Victor from, from many, many years ago, I don't think he's as active now, but he, he with all due respect, is a hustler, right? He's a street racer, 100%. right? And that's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way he is. And so we had a race locked in. When it comes to that street racing, that's of, of that's course. how he is, and that's how you probably should be in a street no, race. No, it's phenomenal. It's, it's great, you know. But and we were friends, right? It's never personal, right? I mean, I can race, you know. We can race for money, and it's not. You know, I'm not gonna race you for ten thousand. Well, that's not true. Uh, I'm At not, the end of the day, it is the car. You yeah, know? you know, it's like it's it's just racing. It's just fun, right? Like if you play poker. If you play for a dollar, it changes the game versus playing for free. Mm -hmm. You don't got to play for a lot of money, but play for something to make the game right. And so we had a race locked in. GTR probably relatively early on in those development too. They weren't fast up top. They yeah. would leave because all wheel drive, but they're 40, 40, 300 pounds, whatever they are. They weren't that fast up top, but they would leave on you. And so we had a race locked in and I thought for sure he's going to jump. 
And so because Victor's smart, Victor knew that I would think he was going to jump, so he sat. So I jump, or I, I leave, and he doesn't go anywhere. And the rule back then, you know, if both cars don't leave, you got to back up, try again. That dude sat like three in a row. And so I, I basically smoked the, you know, the clutch is done, right? right? So the third one, he leaves, and we go. I shift, to, I, I'm in first, I come out of second, I go to shift to the third, it never left second gear. It stayed in second, it's in second gear today. Mm-hmm. It never left second gear. It broke, and I had to tow it home, and then I put a T56 in it. So that's also Gen 1, MT82, yeah. old, old. That, no, no one will ever claim that story is not Victor because it sounds very similar to, oh, yeah. especially was, older Victor. Now he's he's different now, but. You know, the other part of that story too is before that we did a roll race. And he might not admit it, but I got the video, I smoked him in the roll race. Like mm-hmm. 40 to 140, like a couple cars, my little nitrous coyote. Yeah. And so then he's like, all right, we'll do, we'll do a dig now. I was like, fine, we'll do a dig. And I broke my trance. <laughs> Uh, you guys are one and one. <laughs> it sounds like. Uh, well, I'll, I've also raced him for seven thousand dollars before. Oh wow! And that's I'm a, that's a hefty one. I won that. Was one. that at the track? It was. Okay. Yep. That's. Uh, I had my white car, and he had the <sighs> copper car. No, this was uh, a red two uh, J car. A red. Uh, There's uh, a Supra. lot of red induction Supras. There's like four of them things. We yeah. always make fun of them all. As a group, right? Because it's just like, oh, it's a red induction car. Yeah, he. I, I don't. I don't know if it's, I don't think it was his car. It was either a shop car or a customer car, but it was quick. Mm-hmm. And um, again, this was 2015. No one really knew how fast a Coyote could be, you know. And at that time, with my white car, it was going like 920, 9, 915, you know, low nines. Um, and at that time, the fastest stock Coyote, stock motor Coyote, was like a 912. Right in a in a, a production car, the guy yeah. went eight nineties with the the swap, but an actual you know S one ninety seven like production yeah. car, like a big. They're big cars, especially when you park it next to a Supra. Oh yeah, it's huge. And so <laughs> we we had a pot for sixty, I think a sixty eight hundred, and uh, that was the most nervous I've ever been. Yeah, that's you know, a hefty pot. It was a lot. Yeah, and it, again, this is seven grand, two thousand fifteen. That today is probably like yeah. twenty or fifteen or twenty. You know, it was a lot. It was a lot of money. It wasn't all mine. I mean, I had, I had he had his hit his side, and you know, I had me and my eight friends put you know put money together, and uh, yeah, we raced. It's a good video. Do you do you, do you remember um, Grabbelane? The Grabbelane days. What Are was you, that? Uh, 2015 ish. I don't, I don't remember that far back now. Yeah, and so way back, I I remember things from that far back, but I wasn't in the racing scene. Yeah, I don't. I had just moved to Florida, mm, okay. so I wasn't really. Yeah, so way back in the day, you know, before Facebook took over, like forums were still a thing. Oh, like Street Fire, Street Fire dot net. That's one of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So grabalane dot com was uh, our buddy Steve. It was his website mm-hmm. and. He had an online form, and he would make, you know, he'd film all the races and all this stuff. You know, he filmed um, street races and car meets and all that stuff. And so he came out, and he filmed it. It, it, It's a pretty good video. Hmm. Um, But, yeah, we raced for. I wonder where it's floating around. Oh, it's it's on YouTube. On YouTube? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, dude, it probably. Back then, now, it's different now because YouTube back then wasn't as big. I'm sure James could tell us all about it, too. I'm sure he was involved in that stuff. That's how I met James. Yeah. Yeah, with his people don't know James sixty four Nova. Yeah. yeah, that's how that's yeah. Me, yeah, James and I go way back, dude. We we've street raced and track raced many a times. Yes, yeah. Showtime was like the grungier feel oh, track. Yeah. I mean, it's still, of course, is. It's more of like the outlaw, the no prep track. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. James had a sixty four Nova, man. I, I used to call it the cloud surfer because it would come up and set down ever so gently. Mm-hmm. That little that leaf track that leaf uh, leaf spring cow track deal he had, but and he's been racing that thing on the street since he was like twelve. Oh yeah, yeah that's that, yeah that's, that's why I met James. Many, that's funny. Everybody yeah. has a story of everybody local has a story of meeting James street racing him somehow or like right. somewhere on a track somewhere getting beat by him. Dude, we it, it was always like import versus domestic too. There's a couple guys that had like you know two forties like two day swap yep. or like the Evos are big back then. You know, Evos on the street were tough, t- tough to beat. Yeah, and so they only get one hit before they break. But 
if you don't beat them that one hit, that's it. And they they were quick. And uh, there's a, some green Evos, some yellow ones. I mean, it's a whole bunch of them. Huh. That's that's a cool time of Tampa racing history of oh, yeah. 2015, 2017 area, that couple years, probably 2014. Yeah, probably, let's see. So four, cause I had, yeah, probably like late 13, 14-ish mm-hmm. for that three or four years. I mean, you know, we were young back then. We'd, we'd When FL2K would come around, we'd go FL2K, we'd race to the track all day, load up, go to the street races, street race all night, take a nap for an hour, and come back and race again. Shout out all to week. the bridges in Tampa. Bro, <laughs> yes. Yeah, bridges, and then the, there's a few spots that are less well-known, but... Like, I, I'm old now, but I can't, it's hard to think, like, I would not sleep all weekend. Mm-hmm. Like, first of all, that's kind of dumb. You're racing a car at 100 plus miles yeah. an hour on, like, an hour or two of sleep. It's probably not a good idea, but, you know. Whatever. Well, even, like, um, SCT Orlando, there would be a good amount of that. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> I remember your SCT Orlando ordeal pretty, pretty vividly. Which one? I think, one? was it SCT? Where... The guy didn't give you that extra yes. five minutes that oh you my, needed. Dude. What were you fixing? The trans brake button? Dude, it's the dumbest thing. <laughs> I remember that pretty vividly. So, yes. That, again, I, I quit racing that car, and this sounds really arrogant. I don't mean to sound arrogant, but I had done all the races, and we won all the races. Yeah. You know, I, I love Brett to death. I love Jim to death. I raced and beat those guys multiple times. Not because I'm better, it's just because at the time I had the power glide. They were still six R, mm-hmm. and so nobody was going fast back then. You so accomplished we, your goals. Yeah, and we'd show up, man, and I felt like a jerk, you know, because we'd show up. Now, granted, I have sponsors, right? So I'm contractually obligated to show up. Like I have a schedule. Like you know, we agree at the beginning of the year I'm going to attend these eight nine races, you know, mm-hmm. and we're going to compete. And so I'd show up and race, and you know, I'd go like a a seven two. And the next closest guy is like a, a seven nine or an eight oh. It's like it was it was like and that and the car's all stickered and sponsored. It just didn't really fit. Technically it fit the rules, but it didn't really fit the spirit of the class. Like the vibe, like the, yeah, yeah, you know, you know, it'd be like Brett racing a streetcar sh- shootout. Yeah, and he fits. T- absolutely. And he didn't actually race in FL two K streetcar just because yeah. he'd rather go up a class. And it's the same money to win. It was ten yeah, grand in both classes. And yeah. it was be a lot easier in streetcar. Right, because the fastest streetcar went seven twenty. Exactly, he'd mop it up. Yeah. You know, well, one guy went six ninety, but he did blow up his motor so in qualifying. Jeez. That was uh, um, that was yeah. a bad deal. Yeah, <laughs> that's not good. Um, but yeah, so like we raced and raced, raced streetcar takeover. I, you know, I've got thirteen twenty features on the car. Like we raced a lot. Yeah, and it just got to the point. It's like I'm racing myself. I'm beating the car up for nothing. You know, as far as like. Just to campaign it for obligations. Yep. Yeah. And once it went sixes, I had a, a one of my Kuwaiti customers. He wanted to duplicate the car. And I was like, well, I'll just sell you the stuff out of the car. He's like, you sell me the whole drivetrain? I was like, sure. He said, how much? I was like, well, you're not going to like the what well, I'm tell you. I'll sell it to you for But if you want it, I'll sell it to you. And I gave him a, a stupid number, and he agreed. And he, he did it, so he bought it. And so I raced it one or two other times, and that was it. But yeah, streetcar takeover. <laughs> So we, uh, like, I love racing, right? Like, it's it's the third name in my business for a reason. I love racing. Get competitive. In I it. love, dude, if we're playing Uno, it's my mother and I. Sorry, Mom, you're going down. Like, draw four, carry on. You know what I mean? Like, it's, like, my wife and I tried to play Monopoly one time, and that didn't that didn't go very well. Oh, that's tough. Monopoly is a hard one. Yeah. And so it's just, it's just how I am. And so I like to compete. And so if we would go to a race... Every class I fit in, I would buy a tech card for. Mm-hmm. Roll race, you know, at this point, that streetcar takeover had a roll race class, a, a mod, a Ford versus LS class, or mod versus LS class. They had a streetcar class, and I think a couple others. But I fit three of the classes. And so I bought a roll race tech card. I bought a mod versus LS tech card, and I bought a streetcar or a street or a 28 shootout you card. just going to hot lap that car as much as Dude, I horse whipped that thing. Roll race. Now, I'd never roll raced that car on that setup before. I, I always roll raced it on the 6R. Um, and the 6R roll race was fine. Yeah, was, they do good at it. That 1 2 shift, I kept breaking the track. And so, roll racing actually went really well with that car. I raced um, the TRC Supra and some other, other cars. Uh, yep. Javier, uh, probably. Uh, yeah, Viper and those guys. Yeah. 
And so I, I like to get my money's worth. If I'm, if I'm going to go to an event for three or four days, if I can race, I'm going to race. And so we had three tech cards. We roll raced it. I never roll raced a power glide before in my life. Didn't know what I was doing. But yeah, again, we, we the car, you know, again, Coyotes, you know, no one knew how much power they could make and how fast they were. And so we just made more power. So we just drive around everybody in the roll race. We won the roll race. We won the, the Ford versus modular or the, the modular versus Chevy class. Mm-hmm. And then um, what is his name with the red beard? Fred from 1320? Fred from 1320. Yes. Yep. So he, he had come over and, and was interviewing and stuff, you know, between rounds. And uh, so we get all the way to the finals. And now looking back on it, it's my own fault because of how I had it set up. But I had a removable steering wheel. And so I'd hang the steering wheel up on the, on the, cha- on the cage. Mm-hmm. And I didn't think to tag the trans brake wire somewhere to take the tension off the back of the plug. Yep. And so I'd hang it up, and you'd have the whole little you know curly Q uh, wire going to the trans brake. There's such a little connection there. And we went semifinals, got the car cooling off. We're just we're just chilling, hanging out. The car was pretty easy to race. Like it wasn't it was fast, but it wasn't high maintenance. You know. Some kind of wind, probably. Oh, geez. Um, it uh, it was pretty easy to race. Cool down, quick between rounds. It wasn't hard to you know to make it lap after lap. And so we come back semifinals. We're just sitting, chilling, hanging out. You know, yeah. Got the fans, got the fans on. Drink a bottle of water. Maybe had a snack. Just yeah. hanging out. Yeah, no trans cooler, external trans cooler, nothing. anything crazy. Nope, nothing. I put a fan on the engine and I put a fan under the car to get the heat out. And that was mm-hmm. it. We're just hanging out. Just talking. We hear, the, we hear the call of the lanes. Cool. High five. Get ready to go. Yeah. And so the car is up um, on race ramps. So I drive it up on race ramps, and we put a fan on top and a fan underneath to get the air, the hot air out. And so I hop in, put the steering wheel on, fire it up. I put it in reverse. I got no reverse. And I was like, hmm, if you don't know about power glides, if your trans brake goes out, you don't have reverse because that's how the that's how the pro valve body works. Yep. So you put you put the shifter in reverse, but you got to turn the trans brake on to actually back the car. So up. you couldn't just pull up to the lanes and foot brake it or something, you know? You couldn't just. Well, yes, I could have, but you wouldn't have had reverse to kind of. I would have. Had, well, I can't launch the car. All yeah. my all all my every my all my settings. My one launch control yeah. is based off that button. Your advanced traction control. Yeah, exactly. Needs to know when you let off the button. Of course, you know. Now again, hindsight twenty twenty. I had the guy covered by like a probably seven tenths of a second. I could have just rolled up. There. Yeah, I remember it was some like G body or something that wasn't like, you know, it yeah. wasn't breaking records or anything crazy. No, you know, and you know, streetcar takeover has gotten huge now. But back then, there may have been six or eight cars in a class. Yeah. If you had 10, that's a pretty big class. Yep. They would rarely fill out a 16 car field, but they're also just getting started. You know, now they're, I mean, they're big events. Now they're huge. Yeah. And you know, which is great. So I had the guy covered by quite a bit, but I'm like, I would, you know, I don't know what's going on. I, would, I got like flustered. And then we finally figure out, oh, the dang freaking wires pulled out of the trans brake. And so they had, they had come over and gave us the call, you know, you know, to the lanes. And then they gave us a second call. And then I think Garrett or someone came over and, and I, I was like, yeah, I was like, I, I got to fix this real quick. I got to replace this switch. And so then they're like, dude, they're going to go without you. Yeah. And so I literally took the wires, ripped the insulation off of the two wires going to the trans brake and just held them together. Dunk, now I got reverse. Yep. And so I'm like, I'm cool. I'm fired up. We're good. Yeah, that'll like, work. I can work with that. So we get to cut a great light, I'm sure, but <laughs> no, but Hey, I got a functioning car. We'll, we'll make this work. And so we, we back the car off the thing. And as we're pulling up to the, the staging, uh, the staging lanes, dude goes down the track. Yeah. Now, mind you, they You're said like turning the corner and OSW. If you look at the video, I'm in the staging lanes when dude goes on the track. Yeah. And what could have re- nearly chased him. What really fired me up and fired everybody. I mean, my, my camp of three people we had, they told us be in the lanes. I think about like eleven fifty five, because uh, track cutoff is mi- midnight. It was eleven fifty four or whatever the time was. It was a minute before we were in the lanes. Yeah, and they still sent that dude down the track, and we lost. We lost because he, he literally wouldn't have waited twenty more seconds. Yeah, and he had the ability to not wait. 
Exactly. And that's that's where the controversy was. Is, as a racer, if you know somebody's got you covered and you can kind of finagle your way to get that, you right. know, to exactly. get down the track without him next to you, you're seeing that as like a nice, easy, you know, couple grand payday. Exactly. And what, what really got the whole thing fired up is, you know, back then, you know, the car, like Profab, you know, sponsored the car. I say, I mean, I didn't get free work. You know, we, we worked out a deal and, you know, it was beneficial for both parties. But, you know, I've got Profab sticker, you know, Matt from Profab yep. at the time was there. And the guy we're racing was also from Profab. That was the whole controversy. Like, yeah. this dude's from the same dang camp. And, you know, we're not like buddies. I, I didn't know him, but, like, Profab built that car. Yeah. And so Matt was fired up, like, you the know. The same people behind a lot of the yes. chassis work. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so it is what it is. But, yeah, they, 1320, they, <laughs> I wish they would release the video because they filmed my reaction. Because I'm in the staging lanes. I pull into the water box and dude goes down the track. Mm -hmm. And you know, like when you're real mad, but you can't do anything, you can't function because you're so mad, right? Yep. I'm in the car strapped with a five point and a 25, three chassis car. I couldn't get out of that car to save my life. I was so fired up about that dude yeah. leaving. And so I'm in the car strapped. I'm, I'm heat. I'm hot. I'm mad. And, you know, I can't get the window net down. I can't, I can't get out of the car. I'm like, I'm losing my cool. And so I get out and I had some choice words for uh, the track. Probably anyone that was near. Yes. <laughs> and I, I think it was Fred that was there and he was filming. But they, they, they released a video of that race, but they, they, didn't, leave, they didn't release the the, un, the yeah, they un, cut uncut out. version. Yeah, they and for them too, they probably really wanted that race to happen. Of course, yeah. For the filming of yeah. the whole weekend, you want the pinnacle race to end. The, the up fastest happening. class, yeah, the fastest class, the two guys to race, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it was it was frustrating, but it uh, I mean, it's, it was it was fun. It yeah, was, I remember that one. I was there for that. That was we didn't really race at that time. We just kind of went to hang out and park car park the car around right. at the time it was mostly just like a, a hard park car show test and tune car was it 2j back then no not my car leroy that was when i was just with oh you're still with garrett then. we okay. were just i mean we would just oh. go places to park the car and just mm. look at it and you know what garrett was on the mic that night probably i remember yeah he was he was an he was either guest announcing or he was announcing for yeah for street car taker he would do night. a lot of the announcing for them at the, those yeah. type of events at the time and we would just go to park the car and do like a burnout contest. That's it. That's right. Just a standing one. I do remember that. <laughs> that was funny. What do you think of the new dark horse? I mean, you got one. It's stick oh, shift. Oh, yeah, we kind of we kind of shift the gears. Um, I think it's underappreciated. But once they unlock the PCM, people are gonna see what that car is really about. Do you think it's better to buy that car than like a GT three fifty? My personal opinion, you couldn't give me a three fifty. Me personally. Like if you wanted something that was like fun and this, like. No, they're not fun. They suck, in my opinion. Really? I, I work on them all the time. It is the most pain in the butt car to work on. Interesting. They, they're, it's almost like. They vibrate a lot. Don't they, they do. But the it's engines like. engines need like all kinds of counterweights and stupid things like that. Everything is counterweighted. They, it's like, this might, might be the wrong analogy, but it's like maybe having like a hot Italian girlfriend. Hmm. Like, yeah, she's pretty to look at, you know, she's fun to yeah. ride. But she's a pain in the butt every other time. Yeah, and that's how that car is. Like it, just the dumbest stuff. Cause the oil filters come off, or like you know everything shakes and vibrates, and they just do weird stuff. And then you, you go to work on them, and there's just extra stuff everywhere. Like you try and do a basic job in a GT that takes you know an hour, a 350 it takes an hour and a half, huh. because there's more coolers, more shields, more this, just more crap on the car to work around. It's just a pain in the butt. I know Adam LZ lost a car. Oil filter he came lost off. a GT350 because the oil filter came off. They went through like three or four revisions of filters. Yeah, just because they shake so much. Yeah, they vibrate. Yeah, so it's, it's that flat plane crank. Yeah, so a flat plane, flat plane crank is cool. Yeah. You know what else has a flat plane crank? Like a 97 Dodge Caravan. Sounds good on the, uh, on the sticker, though. It's just marketing. Yeah. It's just marketing. Marketing team loves it. Now, like a Mach 1, I love a Mach 1. Because yeah. it's a Coyote normal style V8 with a good, in my opinion, the good trans, you know, and all the good handling. I, I love a Mach 1, but 350, I'm not a fan. So the Dark Horse, to me, it, it, and I think it's going to come out this way once they 
start talking more about it, it's like the Mach 1 replacement. But the difference is the Mach 1 just has a stock Coyote engine. The Dark Horse does not. Okay. It's got, now, it depends who you ask. Um, Ford has already said it's got the better rods, has Predator rods. Okay. Different crank, cams, and pistons. Now, how good are they? We don't know. So that might be like a 1,400 horsepower motor. Absolutely. Right out the right Absolutely. Out the box. So consider consider this, right? How awesome is the Predator GT500? Out of the box. Phenomenal. Yep. Modifiable, phenomenal. It doesn't have direct injection. Mm-hmm. It's got regular injection. And they would be really fast on the drag strip, except for that transmission can't, doesn't let them leave. Exactly. So now... When the, when they announced the S650, my my goal was to have a manual trans dark horse just because I enjoy driving, and then an automatic GT. Mm-hmm. And so, we have a GT on order; it hasn't been built yet, but it got the dark horse first. But yes, I think once the PCM is unlocked, and because yeah, I, I got a Whipple kit on order, right? You know, that's yep. that's, that's 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 the first thing that you can be able to do power wise to them. That'll be a really good car, stick shift Whipple. Yeah, that would be a really good car. Yeah, and then once the you know PCM E eighty five, you're talking a thousand horsepower blower cars are a blast to drive. I, blower cars on the street are just, I love turbos, but like for just like a street car, man, you really can't beat a blower car. It's tough to beat. Justin at VMPs, friend of mine, and like I I love what they do. Like their stuff is great. Like those big VMP blowers are awesome. Oh yeah, like, <laughs> you know, and you know, so I, simple. Yeah, I do, and they. They run. They make mm-hmm. good power. The Whipples are efficient. But until the PCM is unlocked, you're not really going to see the capability because you're stuck, right? What do you? All you can do is take weight out of it. Mm-hmm. If you put a Whipple on there, you can't tune it, right? Like, you, you, you can probably pull it down, which I will do, because it's not like, you know, if, if a car is tuned on 10 pounds, if you go to 12 pounds, it doesn't just blow up. Like, the way the fueling works, it, it doesn't stop at whatever boost level, right? There's There's always... There's more to go, yeah. right? The car will compensate, especially down here at sea level. Yeah, we'll probably get a lot more out of it. If you're up in Colorado or something, sure, you might be a little, might be a little limited, a little tough. <laughs> yeah, but once the PCM is unlocked and you can do E85, you can do twin turbo. All that. I mean, dude, I think you're gonna see the dark horse pull away in terms of what the motor can handle, just because it's not just a GT with more stuff on it. The engine's different mm-hmm. versus the Mach One and the S550 is just, is just a GT technically with a better trans, some you know some handling packages and different you know different actual visuals, but the motor is the same, yeah. right? And so that's my hope at least. That's why I bought one. You know, I think it's I think you're gonna see 13, 1400 horsepower dark horses living a long healthy life, just just because the trans open motors. Yeah, thirteen hundred. I already, mean, that's a wild world to be in. They've already got oil pump gears in them, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's a, it, from what I understand from who I've talked to and people who are in the know, it's a predator short block ish, right? But it has direct injection. And so you're going to have a whole lot better knock suppression, yeah. overall fueling capability. And the car apples to apples is going to make more power because of the DI. It would make sense too, because like when, you know, Ford's producing motors, they're not like they're not really trying to change a lot of what they're doing. Like right. if this is what they're producing, keep producing some more of them, and just keep going with that. Like right. GM did the same thing. They're like LSs are really good, and this is how we build them, and we're gonna build them like this for everything we got. Right. That'd be cool. That that car making thirteen hundred. They look really good too. You know, I mean, I'm biased. I have one, but I think they look great. Right. Yeah. You know, they. I get a lot of thumbs up. You know, you know, yep. People stop. I out the car parked outside. People pull in the parking lot and take pictures of it. You know, so it, it's a head turner. It's a good looking car. I'm sold yeah. on the looks. I'm not sold on the badging. The horse is like it almost just looks like a little black triangle from a distance. Like, it. You know what I mean? Like it just looks like a little like whatever like the coffin shape that they have on right. there. It just looks like a coffin. It's just black. Yeah. You can't see it. No. Yeah. I mean. Like Hellcat did a good job where like you can, you can see, the, see that you, you can see thing. the outline <laughs> you yeah. can see it yeah I mean and there's like that picture of the wine bottle it looks very similar like oh yeah I don't know I mean I'm I'm working on a video of ten things I love and ten things I hate about it yeah and one I'm not a fan of the logo but if that's a worth if that's 
if that's if I, the problem. If, if I'm complaining about that, we live in a good time. Yeah. Right? Like, Dodge is out. Chevy's out. Mm-hmm. That's, this is it. Like, the fact that Ford is even making and producing and actively campaigning a V8 gas-powered car is phenomenal. Yep. The amount of hate that the car gets, people complaining about it, blows my mind. Like, well, There's nothing to hate on with Dodge and, and Chevy because they're not really, like, the C8 is a dud. I've said that. Like, there's there was a twin turbo one out there at FL2K in the 1050 index class and couldn't really do much more. Yeah. Nothing against, you know, the guy that owns that car. Like, it's a cool car, and I'm sure it's fun, but, like, that shouldn't be a 1050 index car. That should be a street car. That should be a... 890 car. I think at least mid to low nines, at least. I mean, maybe I he was in the nines, but I don't think so. Maybe it was 950, but I think it was 1050. That, I mean, 1050 sounds more reasonable. Yeah. And that's twin turbo on a tire. Well, it, it all it comes back to PCM. Yeah. Like they, you know, Ford, or excuse me, HP tuners just got through the the protocol. And, the, and did, you, did you see their announcement about that? No. What HP tuners? Oh, yeah. So. Uh, what is his name? Taj Junk Junkter Junkner, the the main engineer of uh, of Corvette or Chevrolet. Oh, he, he yeah, I know who you're talking. Does about. all the press releases when the new Corvettes come yep. out. He has a a sound a sound bite where he like almost gloats and brags that no one can get this PCM. Like yeah. in the press release, like he he's on he's on record saying that you're not gonna be able to crack this. This is the least cool thing to brag about a car. It is kind of weird, and it took him how many years? Yeah. Four. Years, five years, but yeah, they finally, be. yeah, they finally got in, and now it's cracked. You, you're going to see a lot more C8s that are fast because fuel tech's great, mm-hmm. but piggyback system that's 1996 stuff. You know what I mean? Like piggyback and OEM computers do not play well. You can't control the trans, right? and the trans is everything. Look yeah. at look at GT500. Trans trans rules all, right? So if you if you can't control it and can't tune for it, you're kind of stuck. You know, it could be, you know, however much power, whatever setup you want. But if the PCM is locked, what are you going to do? You know, yeah, it'll sound cool and make cool noises. But, yeah, you know, it's it's such a hindrance to not be able to to modify the PCM because PCM control, control, you know, controls everything. Same issue with the new Mustang. Like, there's all these videos out there, like, people, ba- you, know, you know, bashing it and talking bad about it and how, you know, all this stuff. Like oh well you know these guys went fast because they took weight out it's like well nothing else you can do, yeah. like uh, the tune, yeah you can make more power when you tune them but there's so much more to tuning than just making power. Making power is easy. It, it, literally anybody can make power if you tune a car. Like just add a little bit of timing right like mm-hmm. they, they never they're never max from the factory right. I mean you, you can play with the cam time you can do a couple things you can find power. That's not the secret sauce. The secret sauce is how it drives, torque management, how the power comes in, throttle response, like how snappy is the throttle. If you've got a car that makes the same exact power on a dyno, and this guy, this you know, g- guy A has a lazy stock style throttle and, and driver demand tables and, and tables that control how quickly the power comes in, versus this guy that doesn't and actually has, you know, modified the map and you know how much pedal gives you blade and all these things that make the car accelerate quicker. They can make the exact same power, and it's still going to be not, not a race because this guy's going to go quicker, right? Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that too. Like the guys that tune like an LDR car, if you tried to get like a drivability tune on like a street car to them, no, no chance. No zero. But arguably, they're the best tuners in the world. Those you know X two seventy five tuners. But if if they wanted a car to like not buck at like partial throttle with a monoblade throttle about it, exactly, no exactly. shot, and right. they would be like, "This is stupid. Right. I'm not doing this." Exactly. And like even my my race car, like we don't care much about drivability. Will it do a burnout? Will it stay wet up and throttle? That's yeah. all you worry about. That's it's, it. It's super simple. Yeah. It can drive back from the pass. It can buck a little bit. Like it doesn't need to be perfect. It's sure. really good, but like yeah. Again, like I'm not looking for like right that exact like. You know, GM tunes are so good on like a CTSV that they're just modified. They're not like right. clear it out and start over. Well, I mean, that's how even Ford stuff is. Like, you start with the factory calibration and you don't make wholesale changes. You know, like if you saw the tune in my twin turbo car versus stock, there's a lot of stuff changed. Yeah. But you'd be surprised how much stuff is factory. They like, spend a lot of money especially developing on, that, especially on the trans side. In different environments, they take that thing to like, the winter is cold and started up, and yeah. they, they do a lot. They put that thing in, like, a freezer and see how it acts. Like, 
my buddy John, yeah, Eurist, always tells me, he's like, 12 engineers worked on this for seven years. Are you sure you want to change it? Yeah. It's kind of like that. It's like, they're not idiots. Like, the cars run pretty good. Yeah. You know, you don't, especially when you when you learn to work with the factory control system and the logic and how the, how the computer is designed to operate, dude, the cars run so much better. You know, and so... The fact that the S650 is not currently tunable, it's, not, it's very little to do with power. Like, I've logged it. My car has like 27 degrees of timing at wide open. That's a lot. Yeah. That's not, you know, 22, 23. That's a lot of timing. And it 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 made, you made, what, 440 on my dyno. Especially on, like, whatever fuel the owner might put in there. Yeah. Like, they don't know what, they don't know if it's going to be in California on... Exactly. Whatever fuel they they use, some kind of worse fuel than the rest of the country. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's made of communism. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they they don't really know what it's going to end up to put that kind of timing in a car is somewhat of a risk. Well, it's also that shows you how good the the controls are. That's how good the knock sensors they are. They trust it's it. It's all knock sensors. Dude, it's got mm-hmm. four knock sensors. It knows which cylinder is on which of the four strokes of the engine to know which one had a knock event, and it yeah. pulls out timing for that cylinder only. And the direct injection, like you said, takes it down so much. It, it suppresses a lot. That's why that, you can run 87 octane. Yeah. 87 octane on a 12. Think about that. 87 octane on a factory 12 to 1 mass produced engine. What do they make factory? 450 horsepower almost? Which ones? The dark horse? Uh, 500. 500. It's rated at 500. Wow. The GT is 480. Okay. And that's probably just auto versus manual. Is the is the real very vari- is probably part of the um, variance there? I think it'll be uh, now. I haven't. I've looked for. I, I cannot find the cam specs. GT versus Dark Horse. They say they're reinforced. Whatever that means. Hmm. Um, Maybe they're just welded now from the factory. Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> Dark Horse cam swap my S five fifty. They might be good. Hey, might be onto something. Um, they. Uh, I think the power comes from like the. Um, the cold air intake, like they've got less restriction, you know. I don't know where they get the 20 horsepower from, but same compression. I know that, but maybe the, 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 the cam's different. Like Boss 302, right? So Gen 1 GT had 412 horsepower. Boss had four, 435 or 441, if I remember right, hmm. from the factory. Yeah. Same engine, but yep. Boss had different cams, um, forge rods, forge crank, or same crank, but yeah. forge uh, counted or weighted differently but they had better cams from the factory and so they make more power and obviously a boss intake which helps but do you think the gt 500s are going to come down in price pretty significantly then or i mean those cars are good they are really good street cars from the right out the box um and they look pretty good too i think i mean i hope we'll see i i i imagine there's gonna be an s650 higher end car you know like a a GT500 or whatever, when that comes out, yeah, they're they're probably gonna drop in value. Yeah, because those are I I got to spend a lot of time in one, and I really started to like that car just by fit and finish and interior on those compared to like some of the other Mustangs. Like right. they really did something like special on that car. I sure. feel like mm-hmm. where it's not just like the previous GT500 was very like it just kind of had nicer seats. I feel like. And a bigger engine. And a bigger yeah. engine. Yeah. And this one seemed like a whole new ground up deal. Like the hood had like hood pins on it and like all this stuff that makes you feel like it's like a special car. Yeah, different. Yeah, the rear the, the rear suspension is different. It's yeah. a d- different geometry. Yeah, it's, it's a it definitely the 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 markup on the GT five hundred versus the GT is definitely a noticeable and appreciable difference. Yeah, like, yeah. You sit in it. It does feel different. You feel like it's more of a special car than right the. The comparability there is something. I would like to own one of those cars. I think that that's a, because I like supercharged street cars. I got my CTSV. It's just, it's just the kind of car you want to drive on the sure. street. Oh, yeah. Same with like your dark horse. I mean, that thing with the whip will be a freaking weapon. It's nice, man. Like the the 650 interior, they made, they made small, subtle changes. You know, like when when they showed the pictures and the, the whole tablet deal, it doesn't. Look, it looks bad in pictures. Yeah. But I tell you what, it looks really good in person, and what what you can't really get in pictures until you sit it and see is how it's driver focused, you know. So the the screen on the right is tilted, mm-hmm. right? Well, now when I drive a different vehicle, it looks weird because the the angle of the picture on on the CarPlay or whatever is playing is off, 
because you're so used to it being curved around you. You know, it's like if you're a gamer and you play with curved yeah. monitors, it just it's a better experience for the driver. That's what Toyota did freaking in the 90s. Yeah. Everything was kind of driver-focused yeah. in the Supra, yeah. and that's... It's always been one of the greatest things about the Super, where it was driver focused, and I think cars need to be on that same level. I've seen some people put like the gauges on there. You could put like the Fox Body gauges and yeah. stuff like that, which is a fun, yeah. fun addition to do. The funniest thing is, is the needles bounce. Don't do that. Like a Fox Body does, because they're analog gauges. <laughs> yeah. And so on the tack and the, the speedometer, they bounce a little bit, hmm. just like the just like the old school Fox Bodies do. And they can actually keep up. Like the tack can actually keep up. I imagine the Fox Body ones when you really put some power to them, oh, the tack yeah. was a little slow behind right. there. No, it, it does it does a pretty good job. It has the same green like backlit. It, it's it's cool, but yeah, it it's got a lot of good good things going for it, you know. But until the PCM is unlocked, not for power, just for increasing overall drivability and and hmm. enjoyment in the vehicle, that's when you're gonna see them shine. And so, Lord knows how long that's gonna take. I mean, I'd yeah. imagine. Hopefully soon. We'll probably see one solid axle swapped before long, too. Probably see one with a 8.8 eight and whatever you guys like to call it, the triangulated 3-link. Oh, 3-link, yeah. Yeah. I know, because if you say a Mustang guy has a 4-link, they will correct you. It's not technically a 4-link, and I'm like, well, it is compared to everything else. <laughs> I mean, I see four bars. It looks like a four link like to a me. Four link to me. Just because the top ones go like this a little bit doesn't right. make it not a four link. <laughs> they try to claim it's like not actually as much of a good advantage as it is. It is not as good as a true four link, but it's a lot better than not having that. Yeah, like it. It's it's not a bad setup, but yeah. it's not as good as a true. Jim has always talked about putting in like a bolt in bracket to make it like act like an actual four link. You know, put it up in the in the frame there. Right. You can put like, like a... Like torque boxes? Yeah. Put some different torque boxes up there. <laughs> and then you can add like 50 holes if you wanted to and do whatever you want with it. I mean, I would not need to swap it at that point. Because you can't lower them too far. It's part of the annoying thing about those cars because you throw off the geometry. Have you ever seen the black car? It's pretty low. It's pretty low. Yeah. It's not... I mean, I don't know how much lower you want to go. It tucks the front tire. It tucks the back tire. Yeah. I know on my car in the front, if I lower it too much, I'm just going to get a wheelie in the front. Yeah. And I, I've had people, you know, people like to give advice, and they're like, lower the front. I'm like, well, that doesn't fix the wheelie, really. That just will make it, once it gets too wheeling, it's just going right. to throw all the weight back. Yeah, there's not really much you can do besides actual suspension work on that stuff. Well, man, uh, this was fun. We're going to end it off here. Dude, this was a good time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, where can they find you at? What What can you do for these people if they have a Mustang? What can they call you up and get done? Uh, whatever they want. Yeah. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. And so we've got experience doing. If I can't do it, I, I have a connection with a shop or someone who can mm -hmm. do it. But we almost everything is done in-house. Um, exhaust, you know, blower kits, turbo kits, you know, minor custom fab, you know, obviously tuning, in-house dyno, uh, anything that you can think of within reason and some things without reason. Located in, I would say Palmetto, but is it, it's not really Palmetto, it's north of that. Technically, technically Ruskin. Okay. So it was Hillsborough County, but Ruskin just north of Palmetto. So located in Hillsborough County, just north of Palmetto. If you guys need any Mustang stuff, it's a good shop to go to. Check it out. Justin Jordan, he can help you with the racing side of things, which would be cool too, because that's tough. A lot of people want to go fast, but then they show up and they just get like a tuner right. that won't actually help their car get down the track. Right. Because you're like, oh, what do I do for suspension? They're like, I don't know. I just have a run right. Right. So you can get his experience there. Don't. <laughs> you could go to Justin and avoid a lot of unnecessary R&D that's already been done. <laughs> yeah, we... You know, I, you've already done that R and D. Yeah, you know, I don't, I, I, I only, I like to only speak on firsthand experience. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, some stuff, some stuff you can't have firsthand experience on everything, but, you know, we've got a lot of firsthand experience on everything from 05 and up. So yeah, you name it, we can do it. Well, good deal, guys. Check them out, Justin Jordan, Jordan Performance and Racing. That's right, yep. uh, Jordan Performance on Instagram, Jordan Performance on YouTube. Um. Facebook, 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 yeah. yeah, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Check them out. Send them a message if you guys got a Mustang question or trying to make your Mustang faster. But 
that'll end it off there, guys. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Coop.